ladies and gentlemen, Paul McKenna. to lose weight! Yeah! Who has had enough of dieting? Yeah! Who has tried to, to lose weight before and failed? Yeah! Yeah! Who thinks this might not work either? Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> it's okay. You see, I know what you like. It's perfectly okay to be skeptical. I would be too. This system you're about to experience has helped a lot of people. You do not need to believe in it. All you have to do is follow a few instructions. Over the next four weeks, I'm going to give you the tools to transform the way that you think about food and the way you feel about yourself. This is a unique opportunity to lose weight forever. Tonight, learn the secrets of naturally thin people, change how you think about food for good, and understand how the power of vision can dramatically influence your waistline. It doesn't taste half as good as it tasted yesterday when I could see it. We've got lots of different people from different places, but all here for the same reason. All here to lose weight. I want to actually meet some people, find out a little bit about them. Hello, Hello. what's your name? Tinky. Tinky, where are you from? I'm from Essex. Excellent. And why are you here tonight, Tinky? A number of reasons, Paul. I have a seven-year-old that I can't play with that much. I can't run around, I can't mm. keep up with him. Um, secondly, I would like to be able to go out and buy some nice clothes and I want longevity. I want my life to be better and not centred around food. Okay, and you're up for this, yeah? Yeah. Excellent. 100%. Fantastic. What about you, madam? What's your name? Hi, my name's Dee. I'm from Buckinghamshire. Dee, have you tried to lose weight before? Yes, since I was about um, 19. And what happens? You lose the weight, do you? Yes. And then what happens? It all goes back on again and more as And well. more afterwards. Yeah. Very, very common story. Are you sceptical? Are you open-minded? What do you think? Open-minded. Open-minded. Yeah. Fantastic. OK, let me just have a quick chat with some other people here. Ah, hello. Hello. What's your name? My name's Sue. Sue, where are you from? I'm from South Wales. And you tried to lose weight before? Oh, haven't I just? I was f um, on the diet at 15, on the yeah. diet at 20, on the diet at 30. Yeah. Promised myself I'd be thin at 40. Yeah. I'm soon to be 50, mm -hmm. and there is no way I want to be this size. OK, let's see who else we've got here. Uh, hello, sir. Hi. What's your name? I'm Paul. Paul, um, how much weight do you want to lose for? Um, I've had to lose about three stone. OK. I lost two stone earlier in this year, yep. and I've just put it all back on again, so yep. I keep ballooning up and down. Were you using a diet, were you? Uh, no, that was through some illness, but I was okay. dead chuffed at the end of it that I'd lost the weight. So right. Really <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not the people thinking right now, what illness was that exactly? <laughs> <laughs> but I, just, I just find that I want to um, change my attitude to food as well, because yep. every time I suddenly find that I'm not busy, you sit down, what can I do? I'm going to eat. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So it's kind of comfort eating because you're bored or, you know... Yeah. Uh, well, partly through boredom, but partly through, um, I, I kind of think, well, what can I do to myself to make myself feel better? Yeah, okay. Um, and sometimes sort of punishment or something like that, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, common, common story. Does anybody here resonate with any of those stories? Yeah. Everyone thinks losing weight's hard. I can't lose weight. I've had four children. I'm so sick of dieting. I just can't stand diet food. Everyone I know knows how much weight, that's all I talk about. I want to be thin. I've been on slimming tablets, grains that actually swell up in your stomach. I've even tried acupuncture. It rules my whole life and I'm fed up with it. I've got absolutely no self-discipline. I need a miracle. You are part of the biggest weight loss experiment in the world. Now, before we allowed uh, anybody into the studio this evening, we weighed everybody and... Here is the sum total, the collective weight of our studio audience. <laughs> 3,290 stone. I know one or two of you had a few surprises uh, when you got on the scales. That weight is going to be coming down over the next few weeks. I have spent the last 15 years developing this system. I'm very, very passionate about it. And I don't care if you are a late-night snacker, a binge eater, if you've been overweight all your life, if all your family's overweight, if you've tried every kind of diet and pill and book and anything, and none of it's worked, this system will work for you 
provided you just follow my simple instructions. They don't require willpower. You don't have to believe any of them. All you have to do is remember to follow them. Because a lot of people who are overweight have a story and they have all sorts of excuses. You know, they'll say things like, oh, I, I think it's because I'm big boned. <laughs> or, or they'll say something like, oh, you know, it's just that my metabolism says, if only I've had a fast metabolism, you know, like a metabolism is fixed. Yeah. Or, uh, have you ever done this? Any of you been to a sort of posh dinner party? You've sat there and you've eaten in a perfectly civilised way. You go, I, I just don't know. I put the weight on, don't know. <laughs> and then you've left a little food on your plate, couldn't wait till you got home, and then stuffed some food in your face. <laughs> yes? <laughs> OK, I want you to know something. If you're overweight, as far as I'm concerned, it is not your fault. It's not. It's the fault of your programming. Your brain is like a computer but it's only as good as the software that it's running. And so if you're overweight, the software needs adjusting. That's all it is. Now, I don't mind if you're skeptical. You've tried to lose weight before, haven't you? And you failed. And many of you have tried many, many times, yeah? And so you've got evidence that losing weight is difficult, yes? I'm going to share with you the secrets of naturally thin people. And then over the next few weeks, I'm going to show you how to stop cravings and overcome emotional eating, how to speed up your metabolism, how to become totally motivated to take exercise and feel good about yourself. If, for example, um, all you did was lose weight, but you still felt bad, where would the freedom be in that? I mean, I've met many of the world's most famous models for research purposes. And <laughs> I'm going to tell you, a lot of them are really miserable because they're hungry all the time. So what I want to say to you is it's not just about losing weight, it's about feeling good about yourself. Now, one of the things I'm going to ask you to do, first of all, is to stop dieting. Because you've already tried dieting and you found it doesn't work. Not only uh, did it not work, many of you found it's made you more overweight than before you started the diet. The research, and there's been a lot in the last 40 years, shows that diets work for 9% of people on average. So that means 91% of dieters fail. That's an extraordinary failure rate. And not only do people fail, they put on more weight very often than before they went on the diet. And, it, and, and it's for this reason. As soon as you starve your body, it thinks that there's a famine on. It goes into fat storage mode. Yeah? What happens is you find that your metabolism slows down, so you actually leach more fat from the food that you're eating. And you feel lethargic, sometimes mildly depressed, and you get tense around food. You start to worry about, you know, have I had this and that and calorie counting? Oh my god, I've had a bit of chocolate. I am evil. I must now eat lettuce for a month. Yeah? <laughs> that kind of mentality. Yes? You know what I'm talking about. So basically, what we've got to do is stop starving ourselves. I think that diets are nothing more than training courses in how to get fat and feel like a failure. Now, one of the reasons that this system works so well is because the imagination is always more powerful than the will. So I'm going to be asking you to use your imagination this evening to reprogram the way that you think about food and the way you feel about yourself. In a moment, I'm going to reveal to you the secrets of naturally thin people, the four golden rules, the simple habits that make you eat and think like a thin person. Now, everybody here in the audience, you should have a knife and fork with you. Have you got that? Can you just show me? Yes? Okay, if you're watching at home, go get yourself a knife and fork because you'll need it for the golden rules coming up in just a moment. Still to come, change how you think about food forever, the amazing power your eyes have over your appetite, and learn the secrets of naturally thin people. If I told you that there was a weight loss pill that had a 71% success rate, there was no side effects, who'd be interested in taking that? <laughs> Oh, of course you would. Well, this is not a magic pill. It's a conditioning system. It's a way of thinking and acting. You follow some simple rules. I know some of you thought that you were going to come here and I was going to hypnotize you. I was going to say, look into my eyes, look into my eyes, look around the eyes. And you feel this compulsion to just suddenly never eat again. It doesn't work like that. But it is really simple and very magical. Because let's begin with those secrets of naturally thin people. Four golden rules that are going to change the way you think about food and the way you act around food. Let's begin with golden rule number one. When you're hungry, eat. What you've been doing in the past, though, is you've been starving yourself, haven't you? 
And when you starve yourself, you know what happens. Your body thinks there's a famine on, it stores fat in its cells, slows metabolism, makes you feel tense, sets up all these patterns in your unconscious mind, which are really unhelpful. So what I want you to do in future is I want you to tell your body there will always be enough food. When you feel hungry, I want you to go and eat. I want to reveal something to you now that I call the hunger scale. Uh, this is a way of gauging where you are. Now, right in the middle, number five is neutral. And as we move up, four, three, two, one, you've got hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. As you move down, you've got fuller and fuller and fuller, yeah? So never, ever allow yourself to become physically faint or ravenous ever again. Equally, never allow yourself to get stuffed and bloated. So I want you to live in this middle section here. Because a lot of you do this. What you do is you go, uh, I know what I'll do. I'll starve myself all day. I won't have any breakfast. I'll sort of wait till 4 o'clock, thinking that that somehow was going to help you lose weight. And then 4 o'clock comes, and you binge like mad, yeah? <laughs> You're living in the extremes at the top end and the bottom end, and you've got to stop doing that, yeah? You've got to suddenly start to tell your body there will always be enough food so it can speed up the metabolism, yeah? This is how, you know, some of you have looked at people who are naturally thin and they seem to be able to eat whatever they want, right? And you go, oh, lucky them. It's because they haven't altered their metabolism by starving themselves or stuffing themselves. So when you're hungry in future, what are you going to do? Go and... Eat! Okay, there's a natural communication between the stomach and the brain. This is not a theory, it's a scientific fact. Our bodies are designed to eat when we're hungry and stop when we're satisfied. But many of us have picked up bad habits and rarely listen to our body's signals. With the average person in Britain now consuming nearly one and a half thousand pounds of food every year, there are lots of different reasons why people eat, although often it's not because we're truly hungry. The physiological hunger comes from the gut being empty and giving signals to the brain of emptiness and making gurgling and rumbling noises and uh, demanding the, to the brain that we go out and, and hunt for food. The rumbling noises that our stomach makes when we're hungry is quite simply the increased muscular activity of the stomach, the increased peristaltic waves or the ripple effect. So what really goes on in the brain when we're hungry? The most important part of the brain that deals with appetite and hunger is a small region deep within the brain called the hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus receives signals from the stomach that the stomach's hungry and needs to eat in the form of chemical messengers. Particularly, there's a chemical that's released by your stomach called ghrelin. And when you're hungry, your stomach produces more of this hormone. And that sends chemical messages up to your brain, directly to your hypothalamus. And your hypothalamus then lets you know that you're hungry and you ought to eat something. But the natural state of hunger is different from the desire to eat. And unfortunately, many people are used to overriding the body's internal signals. And as we know, that desire to eat can be incredibly powerful. We eat because other people are eating. We eat because there's food there on our plate. We can eat even if we're not hungry because of all the pleasurable sensations that go with it. For instance, we can eat a, a pizza and not be hungry at all, but still, when the ice cream comes along, we eat ice cream because it's yummy and tasty and everyone else is doing it, so we can override the hunger. People eat for reasons other than hunger. These reasons are generally psychological and can include things like boredom, stress, grief, and generally emotional responses. People often have an emotional response that involves turning to food. OK, anybody that's overweight has desensitised themselves, but there's a very simple way to begin the resensitization process. Remember a time you were totally and utterly ravenous. You know, one of those times that you'd work in all day and you hadn't had a chance to eat, and you were like, oh, I cannot wait to eat. One of those times. Return to it now and see what you saw, hear what you heard, and feel how hungry you felt. Remember it now, that's it. OK, now, what I want you to do is remember a time you felt totally and utterly stuffed. You know, sort of after Christmas lunch, a sort of, oh, monsieur, have you got a bucket sort of thing, yes? Now, I noticed that nobody had to really think about that. You went, oh, yes, I remember a time I felt totally stuffed. Now, contrast that with the ravenous feeling. Ravenous time, stuffed time. Compare the two and let your body resensitize and recalibrate. I'm talking about physical hunger as opposed to emotional hunger. The difference is this, physical hunger comes on gradually, emotional hunger comes on suddenly. And you usually get emotional hunger when, say, you've had an argument and, you know, you suddenly want to change how you feel with food. I'm going to show you next week how to deal with emotional hunger. OK, time to move on with golden rule number two. 
eat what you want. Now, as soon as you make a food forbidden, guess what happens? It becomes really, really attractive, doesn't it? Oh, that's all you can think about. And in my system, there are no forbidden foods. Yes, you can eat whatever you want and still lose weight, provided you stick to this system. I don't want you to combine this system with a diet, though. I want you to enjoy what it is you eat. I don't want you to have any forbidden foods, because as soon as you make a food forbidden, suddenly it's got power over you. You're thinking about it all the time, you get tense around it. So by going, nothing is forbidden, you take your control back, your power back, yes? So there are no forbidden foods. And I also want you to tune in to the natural wisdom and sensitivity of your body. Anybody here had a baby? Yes? Okay. Well, when you were pregnant, do you remember one minute you wanted pickled onions, the next minute you wanted ice cream, you suddenly felt that compulsion? Because you were building a baby, your body's wisdom knew that it needed certain nutrients and it drove you in that direction. You need to begin to trust that wisdom again. Now, some people go, oh my God, if I just eat what I want, all I'll eat is chocolate all the time. <laughs> well, not necessarily, because we've still a couple more rules to come. But what I do want you to do is I want you to go to your fridge or to the cupboard where you keep your food and throw out any foods that don't totally inspire you. So, you know those uh, low-fat meals? <laughs> yeah, low-fat meals that taste revolt. <laughs> Chuck them out! Yes, those diet drinks, chuck them out. Anything that doesn't totally inspire you, out it goes, yes? Naturally thin people eat chocolate and cheese and crisps and all these things, yeah? They eat these forbidden foods. But it's the way they eat them that's important. Now, I know some of you are thinking, no, he's completely lost it now, hasn't he? I mean, first of all, he said, when I'm hungry, go and eat, because I'm never going to stop. And then he said, eat what you want. He's barking, isn't he? You haven't heard the other golden rules yet. It's totally OK for you to be sceptical, because what you've tried in the past hasn't worked. This is a unique and different system. So in future, when you're hungry, what are you going to do? Go and eat. And eat what you want, not what you think you should. We've selected one family and started them off early on the system so that you can see the challenges they face and the progress that they make over the next four weeks. They're a very nice bunch of people with some bad habits. Meet the Crisfords. Their unhealthy lifestyle has eventually caught up with them. This family of heavyweights are desperate for change. Chris is a pub landlord and loves a fry-up. Kim is always on the go and a serious snacker. Ben is a self-proclaimed couch potato and the ultimate cookie monster. Last, but definitely not least, is Haley. She's got to her size by picking food off her kids' plates. Together, they weigh a massive 88 stone. <laughs> Come on! Baby, don't you wanna go? Chris and Kim had always dreamed of owning a pub. Now, after four years, their health and well-being are in serious danger. Sweetheart! My worst thing is breakfast. Egg, bacon, sausage, mushrooms. My main problem that I need to change is the constant snacking. I'll have a packet of crisps or I'll have a packet of nuts. We eat the wrong stuff at the wrong times. It's always fried. I sit at home a lot of the time with the kids and whatever they leave I tend to eat. Crisps are my major downfall. Pretty lazy person. I get out of bed and I watch the telly eat biscuits with coffee and then I'll have my dinner and I'll go to work and at work I'd pretty much sit in a chair and watch DVDs. <laughs> I mean, I'm of that stage now where I have difficulty putting socks on. So I want to stop it now. The Crispets have started the weight loss program early so you can see their highs and lows as they go through the week. Just two Thank eggs. It's disappointing there's no liver sausage, but I won't... They're going to learn to be conscious of their patterns around food. So instead of snacking on autopilot, they'll become aware of everything they eat. They should start to think, am I really hungry? Or did I just want to change the way I feel? They're going to learn to eat when they're hungry, eat what they want, eat consciously. And if they think they're full, stop. If they follow these simple instructions, they should see some immediate results. It's day one and things seem to be going well. I've been consciously thinking about what I'm eating, put my oven fork down between mouthfuls. I feel really good today, I've got to admit. I mean, so good that, you know, I can't stop smiling. I haven't been near the fridge. Portion sizes are going down considerably. 
A few days in, and there's been some progress. I've done a belt up one extra notch, and this is only after three days. 8,809 steps. It's not bad for a day. But some of the family are finding things a little bit more difficult. I wasn't really hungry at all, but felt I should have something, which isn't part of the rules, I know. So, really naughty. I was really down yesterday. Um, I felt like I'd betrayed myself. Today, I woke up thinking I'm going to have a fresh start. It's the end of the week, and the family have seen some amazing changes. I have totally changed my outlook on everything, on food, on the way I look at it, on the way I eat it, on the way I taste it, and it is just inspirational. I just feel like my whole attitude to everything has changed. Um, hopefully it can only get better and better and better. It's been a positive week for the family, but if they want to succeed in losing weight, they'll have to learn how to beat their cravings. I know uh, that I've got some nice cookies in the cupboard that I'm dying to eat, but I won't. <laughs> I feel super. <laughs> and the Crisfords are here with us this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give them a nice round of applause, shall we? Chris, how would you say you're finding it? You stick to the rules and it's easy. You don't have to think about it. Yeah. What would you say to uh, somebody who's sceptical? Give it a try. I was, no one was more sceptical than me. Yeah. And it is absolutely superb. And can you feel a difference in the clothes at all? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. What do you, what's your energy levels like? A lot more. <laughs> Yeah. Higher, yeah. definitely. Well, you're an inspiration to us. I know you've got a few challenges. There were a few challenges with cravings. Yeah. yeah. OK, and next week, I'm going to show you how to overcome cravings and overcome emotional eating in general. Are you ready for golden rule number three? Eat consciously. I've noticed uh, a very unusual thing about people who are overweight. They think about food all the time except when they're actually eating it. And then they shovel the food in as fast as they can. They virtually hoover it off the plate. Now, why would anyone do that? Well, there's actually a very good scientific reason, because whenever we do anything that reinforces our survival, like eating, we release a happy chemical inside our brains called serotonin. So people that are overweight are shoveling the food in for a good reason. They're not tasting the food, they're not really chewing it, but they're getting high as a kite from all the serotonin they're releasing. But the trouble is, because you're going like the clappers, though, you can't hear the signal from your tummy that says that you're full, so you eat past that. You see, what happens is there's a lag between the time that your, your tummy gets full and the message reaches your brain. And when you're eating as fast as you can, you literally anaesthetize yourself. You eat past that signal when you're full, you expand your stomach, and so afterwards you feel bloated, you feel guilty, and then you go, well, that's terrible, so you have to go and do it two hours again later uh, to take away from that feeling again, yeah? So what I'm going to ask you to do is very, very simple. I want you to slow your eating speed down. In fact, what I want you to do, and this is, this is really the kernel of the system, this is so important. In order to become conscious, I need you to put the knife and fork down while you're chewing the food, yeah? If you're eating a sandwich, prise your fingers <laughs> off the sandwich <laughs> and put it down. <laughs> and then I want you to chew about 20 times, unless, of course, you're having soup. Chew about 20 times, like this, like, mmm, mmm, mm. You know, eat your food like a gourmet. Savour each mouthful. And if you need to, sit on your hands. Yeah? And chew in this slow way. Taste... Did you know, as you chew the food, the texture and the taste actually changes? Yeah? Many of you haven't really chewed your food for a long time. You just bam, 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 yeah? And by the way, in order to stay totally and utterly conscious, no watching TV when you eat, no reading a newspaper, and also, I don't want you to have any alcohol with the meal. You can have it afterwards or some other time, but just for the next few days, and if you cannot go a few days without having an alcoholic drink at the time of eating, 
Food is not your problem. You're a much bigger problem. <laughs> Everyone can go a little while without drinking, yes? Now, athletes do something called mental rehearsal. Before a, you know, a golfer hits a ball into the hole, he visualizes it going in there. Before a footballer kicks the ball in the back of the net, he imagines where it's going to go. Athletes rehearse in their mind, they imagine it so they can do it in a split second and send the ball where they want to. And what happens is, through the process of imagination, we reinforce something called muscle memory. There's a famous story about an American basketball coach who took his team and he split the team into two and he had one half of the team throw the balls into the basket. He had the other half of the team imagine throwing the balls into the basket. And he had them do this for a while and at the end of the experiment the half of the team that had been imagining it dramatically improved because they never missed a shot. Okay? Uh, what they had done is they had reinforced through visualization the message of football in basket into their muscle memory. So what we're going to do in just a moment is we're going to reinforce in our muscle memory a slower eating speed. So get your knives and forks out. If you're watching at home, I want you to get your knife and forks. What we're about to do does look a bit silly, but it is not stupid. Because when we practice this, we will be learning to do this at a slower speed. We'll be changing the relationship you have to food, changing your habits around food. So, everybody ready? Knife and fork at the ready? Now, what I want you to do is imagine you've got a plate of your favorite food in front of you there. Yes. What have you got there? Lasagna. Lasagna and chips, yes. What about, say, up there? What have you got up there, madam? Macaroni. Macaroni. What about here? Sirloin. Sirloin. Yes. What about over here? Chicken madras. Chicken madras. Yes. What about over here? Chili. Chili. Lovely. Okay. So, oh, some of you are salivating already, aren't you? <laughs> Get the knife and fork ready. Here we go. You see, I said the imagination's more powerful than the will. Imagination's very powerful. So cut a little bit. There we go. Take that bit. Put it in your mouth. And knife and fork. And chew it. Mm. Knife and fork down. Mm. Slowly. Mm. Do it at home. Do it at home. Here we go. That's a good. Do it at home. Knife and fork. I, there are people all over the country doing this. I know there are some people going, oh, for God's sake, yes? <laughs> you are probably the ones who most need to do this, okay? A little tiny bit. Go on. Knife and fork down. There we go. Mmm. Mmm. Chew it slowly. Mmm. That's it. Learn what it's going to be like. Recondition your muscle memory, yes? Because you've been doing it in a way in the past that was unhelpful. So everybody again, again. Here we go. Unless, of course, you've finished eating. <laughs> Take a little bit, put it in your mouth, knife and fork down. Mmm, mm, savour it. Mmm, that's it. Oh, lovely, that's it. Now, some of you are thinking, well, that is really, really slow. <laughs> but it's because you've been going like the clappers. It feels really slow. It's a bit like, you know when you come off the slip road on the motorway, suddenly you realise how fast you were going, yes? This is going to feel like it's really slow, but believe me, it's nowhere near slow enough. I want you to get slower and slower and slower over the next few days. I want you to get so slow that your food goes cold. That's how slow I want you. Yeah, real slow. And some people go, but I might feel a bit self-conscious. <laughs> yes, it's a small price to pay. <laughs> By the way, you think people are looking at you, but actually they're not. They, they are when you're going... <laughs> yeah. So, what are you going to do when you're hungry? Go and... Eat! And you're going to eat what you... What? And how are you going to eat? And enjoy every mouthful. Okay, in a moment I'll be giving you the final golden rule. And I'll be showing you the results of an absolutely amazing experiment. It doesn't taste half as good as it tasted yesterday when I could see it. And discover why it's essential to ban scales on this weight loss system. for golden rule number four. Yes! When you're full, stop. Now, this may seem like I'm stating the obvious, but it's something that people that are overweight don't do. And I'll tell you why. Because when you're eating really, really fast, you're flooding your brain with serotonin, the happy neurotransmitter. You feel as high as a kite. You've anaesthetized yourself. You can't hear that signal that says you're full. You eat past the signal because you're completely out of your brains. 
Yeah, you're lovely, 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 lovely food, yeah? You're not conscious of the process, you're not paying attention to your body's wisdom, and what I need you to do is to begin to become more sensitive. Let's have another look at that hunger scale, shall we? Fine to live in the white area, to get slightly hungry, fairly hungry, and then start eating, and as you start eating, get satisfied and then full, but do not get stuffed and bloated and nauseous. How do I know when I'm full? Well, you know, you might not absolutely know. I know that a lot of people say, but, no, but I can't be... Just guess. It's okay. It doesn't matter if you're not absolutely right. It's like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. And naturally thin people find it very difficult to override that signal. The only reason you're able to override it is because you practiced at it. Now, I know that probably many of you, when you grew up, were guilted into finishing everything on your plate. Anybody a member of the Clean Plate Club here? Yes. I know the same thing. When I was a kid, my parents would say to me, God, I can't believe you're not going to finish that. There are starving children in India. And I would say, oh, what, like me being overweight is going to make them feel better or something like that? It? No need to be like that. And, of course, very popular excuse, this one. People go, well, you know, if I'm round at a friend's house and uh, we're eating and they've prepared this meal... I just think it would be so insulting to the host not to finish it all, so that's why I have to clean my plate. Now, look, if you think that, and you think that you're going to be embarrassed, I want you to leave some food on your plate, and if anyone gives you a hard time, you go, oh, I'm sorry, I'd love to finish it, but that Paul McHenry's messed with me mind. I, I can't, I can't finish it. Yeah? I want you to always leave something on your plate. Always leave something on your plate, because I want you to signal to your unconscious that there's a new sheriff in town, that things are different. Take back control. By adjusting these simple habits, some amazing changes start to happen. Take a look at this incredible experiment. In order to show just how much vision influences eating habits, we took a group of five hungry members of the public to a diner in London's Docklands. They've no pre-knowledge of the experiment, but we have promised them they'll get fed. Pretty starving this morning. I could eat a good breakfast. I'm pretty hungry today. I'm looking forward to a big plate of bacon and eggs and hash browns. <laughs> Thanks very much for asking. I'm ravenous. You know the music search it's day one, and our diners tuck into exactly the same plate of food a full breakfast fry up. Without exception, all five diners cleared their plates. On day two, all five diners are asked to eat the same breakfast, but this time they've got to wear a blindfold. Unable to see the food, our diners will now be eating more slowly. They'll also be concentrating more consciously on the taste, smell and texture of their breakfast. According to recent research in Sweden, people ate 24% less food when blindfolded without feeling less full. When they listened to their internal signals of hunger, they stopped eating when they were satisfied. I find it quite strange, actually. You do feel full a lot sooner, and I think you're a lot more aware of what you're eating. I find that I'm a lot more aware of the, the different textures and tastes, I think. I've got no idea how much I've eaten. Um... Yeah, just not really enjoying it at all. With our experiment, not only did the diners eat significantly less food, but surprisingly, they didn't enjoy the food nearly as much whilst wearing the blindfolds. It doesn't taste half as good as it tasted yesterday when I could see it. Feeling a bit sick, actually. It's just really, really salty. After three minutes eating, I said, no, I have to stop because I'm sick. The food didn't taste as good today, and I don't know if it's because I couldn't see it. I don't know if, I, if it's because I couldn't see the colours. When you take away somebody's visual cues, that makes them, in a sense, listen to the physical responses of their body. And therefore, even though all of us have been trained to finish our plates and it's polite to eat everything on your plate, when you can't see what you've left on your plate, then you have to respond to the physical sensations within your body. And your brain is telling you that you've eaten enough and therefore that's the only cue you've got. And therefore, it shows that if we did actually listen to our brains, then we would eat substantially less.
an amazing experiment. Not only are you going to find that as you eat consciously, you eat less because you can hear that signal from your tummy telling you you're full, but you might find your preferences change. You notice that those people weren't so keen on all the salt and things like that. You might find the same. Over the next few days, as you eat consciously, you start to eat differently. What else might you expect over the next few days? I can guarantee you something. You will make mistakes. You will either binge or you'll eat too fast. You'll forget to follow the rules. And you know what? You've got two choices at that point. You can go, oh, I failed. It's terrible. I'll just have to abandon it and go back to being overweight. It's so terrible, yeah? And beat yourself up and quit. Or you can do this. You can go, I made a mistake. Forgive yourself and just go back to using the golden rules again. Yeah? When a baby learns to walk, it doesn't walk first time falls over and we don't go, oh, guess this one isn't a walker. <laughs> Do you know? well, we pick them up and give them another go. Be kind to yourself. By the way, there's something else I want you to do. There's a magic weight loss elixir called water. And I want you to have water because when you think you're hungry, there's actually a 75% chance that you're dehydrated and you're really thirsty. So what I would like you to do is to go and have a glass of water. There was one lady I know who used um, my system and she lost four stone, predominantly focusing on this. Every time she felt hungry, she'd go and have a glass of water. If she still felt hungry, then obviously she'd go and eat. But if not, she'd think, oh, I was actually really thirsty. So every time you feel hungry, have some water. Now, what are you going to do when you're hungry? You're going to go and eat. And you're going to eat what you want. And how are you going to eat? And when you think you're full, you're going to stop. Something else I want to draw your attention to is the scales. Who here weighs themselves every day? Something I'd like you to do, stop it. Because, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to jump on the scales and suddenly, oh, a couple of stone in the night. That's fantastic. <laughs> The more you look at that thing and obsess about it, the more you reinforce that it isn't working. You get totally obsessed with the tiny little movements of that needle. Okay, who's guilty of that? <laughs> I want you to stop that. I'm going to ban you now from weighing yourself for three weeks. And I mean it. And there's a very good reason for this. What we want you to do is to give yourself time to notice some success. Also, your weight is going to go up and down over the next few weeks. Because naturally thin people's weight goes up and down. What I want you to do is instead of obsessing about whether well, I'm in course or not, just keep your mind on where it is you're going. Okay, so what questions do you have? Who's got some questions? Yes, ma'am. Alcohol. Yes. What oh. about it, eh? Are we still allowed to drink alcohol? Or? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't drink alcohol. The thing is this. I don't want you to drink the alcohol at the time when you're, when you're eating, because I want you to be totally conscious of that. But, yeah, absolutely drink as much alcohol uh, as you feel comfortable with. Yes. And you know what will be right for you. I, myself, have now gone... 23 days without a drink, and I, I'm very proud of that. So, not all in a row in the last 10 years, but, you know, I'm just... I'm really proud of that. <laughs> OK, so does that answer your question? Excellent. Who else? Ah, gentleman down here. Yes, sir. Are you suggesting that we do away with, with meal times? Graze and have a nose bag, that type of thing. Um, have, graze and have a nose? No. No. No, no, no. What I want you to do is, when you're hungry, go and eat, mm. yeah? But not, like... 
oh, I think I'll just have crisps there all the time, yeah? Because that, you, you totally... Unless you're eating a crisp consciously, unless you eat it, you taste it, and you put a bit down, and then you eat a bit more, yeah, that would be eating it consciously. Actually, when you say grazing, you mean eat um, little and often, right? Yes. Provided you're genuinely hungry, so yes, that would be excellent. Thank you. OK, this lady here. Uh, when you say eating when you're hungry, breakfast, so you're saying we shouldn't get up in the morning and eat breakfast as a matter of course? Well, or if you are hungry, eating. then you should do. If you're not, then don't. Chances are you probably will be. Really resensitize. Get, get Check in with yourself. Do a little body scan. Go, am I hungry or not? Yeah? Am I genuinely hungry? And if you are, go and eat. If not, but by the way, you might find that you get going and, you know, sort of half an hour into the morning you suddenly want to eat. That's when to do it, yeah? Right. Or if you're beginning to feel those beginning pangs of hunger, yeah, coming on, you know that you are going to be hungry, yeah? So it's okay to go and eat. Okay, thank you. Who else? What about here? Um, it often happens that at the end of my working day I have to go to a seminar or something spur of the moment. Yeah. And I haven't planned. And when I'm there, suddenly get hungry. Yeah. But because they don't have food that I would class as healthy... Yes. I don't eat, even when I'm hungry. So yes. I get hungry and hungry and then don't end up eating for the entire night because it's too late by the time I get home. Are you saying that too I late? should eat? Too late? Well, about half eleven at night. OK, what I'm going to say to you is this. You can take some food with you. If you had to, if your doctor told you, I'm afraid even if you're at that seminar, uh, you have to go and eat, because your health is paramount, what would you do? I'd eat. Yeah. Now, being overweight, is that healthy for you? No. So it's for your good health and for your well-being that you need to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And we know that speeding up your metabolism, eating when you're hungry, will do that. So will you do that? Will you put yourself first? See, I keep hearing this. People are putting their jobs before themselves. You need to show more self-care. You need to show yourself more respect, value yourself. Will you put yourself first? Yes. Okay. You can do that. Yes. And you will do that. I will. Thank you. Let's give her a nice round of applause. Oh, yes. Okay, before we finish, one more simple technique. This is an important technique. As I've already explained this evening, the mind and the body are intimately linked. One is always affecting the other. Now, when people are overweight, they tend to think of themselves as overweight continually, reinforcing that. What I need you to do is to start to think how it will be when you've lost weight, when you've become thinner. If you want to do this with your eyes closed, that's absolutely fine as long as it's safe and appropriate to do so. I want you to imagine how you'll look when you're a few pounds lighter, maybe even half a stone lighter. Imagine how you'll look, how you'll stand, how you'll breathe, how you'll smile, how you'll speak, everything. Now, I want you to float into that thinner you. Feel how much thinner it feels, and how much nicer, how much more confident, how much lighter. And from this place, imagine a slightly thinner you. How do you walk and talk and sit and breathe and smile and stand? That's it. Watch exactly what you're like. From this place, imagine a you at your ideal weight and float into that ideal you. Now, I want you to imagine it's your ideal day. Just run through it. What are the main moments in this ideal day? Through the morning, through the afternoon and the evening. As you do this, you're creating a roadmap for your mind and body to take you in this direction of becoming that thinner self. I want you to do this every day. The more you do it, the more likely you are to become that person. Because we get more of what we focus on in life. Okay, and then open your eyes and come on back out. Even though you might experience instant success, if you're going to lose weight permanently, there's still some important techniques you need. Next time, learn how to instantly switch off cravings. I don't see it getting any better at the minute. I'm just, I feel like I've lost. There's no fight left in me. Two weeks in, and our heavyweight family's eating habits are being transformed. I've come from that down to that, and that is more than enough for me. And discover how to overcome emotional hunger forever. Thank you very much. See you next week. I feel really good about myself at the moment. A bit sceptical still about whether it, you know, I will lose any, but I think I will, yeah. He so knows what he's talking about. I'm still a bit sceptical. I don't, I don't know if it's going to work. It seems so simple that I think, why didn't I do it before? If you want to be able to eat whatever you want and still lose weight, you can't afford to miss this show. Tonight, why hating your body can stop you from losing weight. 
I'll show you how to boost your confidence and reduce your waistline permanently. We'll be revealing the science behind binge eating and a powerful technique to banish it forever. Are you ready to lose weight forever? To feel better about yourself? To escape your fixation with food? This is not a diet. You can join in and make this Britain's biggest weight loss experiment. All you have to lose is weight. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul McKenna. Yeah. Who here wants to lose weight? Yeah. Who thinks they might have already lost some weight? Yeah. I know, because some of you have been naughty and have been weighing yourselves, haven't you? Yes. Who's been weighing themselves? Yes. Now, I know I said don't weigh yourself, but some of you were so tempted to because you wanted to see how well it was going. Who hasn't weighed themselves but has got a lot more room inside their clothes? Yes. Excellent. Who has found that their relationship to food has changed? Who's found that they've stopped fixating about food, they feel more in control around food? Excellent. That's what we wanted to see. Okay, we're halfway through the weight loss system, but if you've only just joined us, don't worry. It's not too late. You can still join in. Here's a quick reminder of what I've taught so far. We've learned the secrets of naturally thin people. Follow these four rules and it will change the way you feel about food forever. Rule number one. When you're hungry, eat. Never starve yourself because it slows your metabolism and your body stores fat. Let your body know that there'll always be enough food. Rule number two, eat what you want and not what you think you should. When you make a food forbidden, it instantly becomes more attractive. Never let food have power over you ever again. If you want something, have it. Rule number three, eat consciously. Slow your eating speed down to about a quarter and enjoy every mouthful. Put your knife and fork down between each mouthful. That way, you can hear the signal from your stomach that lets you know when you're getting full. Rule number four. When you think you're full, stop eating. Never get stuffed or bloated ever again. This is the way that naturally thin people eat. As you follow these four simple rules, your eating patterns will change forever. Follow the four golden rules. When you're hungry, eat. Eat what you want. Eat consciously. And when you think you're full, stop. Last week, I also showed you how to instantly overcome any cravings using the amazing TFT tapping technique. By tapping on various acupuncture points, you reprogram your brain just like a computer so that any craving will instantly disappear. Who'd like to, uh, to share with us some of the things that they've noticed over the, the last few weeks? Yes, let me come and have a quick chat with this gentleman over here. Hello, sir, your name is... Ian Sample. Ian, where are you from? I'm from Tamworth in Staffordshire. Okay. Ian, what have you noticed? Well, I've got a lot more energy. Right. I've got a lot more energy. Um, I, I can actually run up the stairs now as opposed to crawl up. Excellent. Up the banister, one hand over the other. Yep. Um, so I've lost... I know I should have weighed myself, but I've lost 15 pounds. Fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. Excellent. Anybody else here also found they've got more energy? Show me. Who else has got more energy? Now, this will be for one very simple reason. When you're dieting, of course, you're starving yourself. Your body goes into starvation mode, survival mode. And you know how it is. You feel lethargic, mildly depressed. When you feed yourself or when you're hungry, of course, metabolism speeds up. Your body knows there isn't a famine on. There's always going to be enough food. So guess what? You have more energy. This is great. Anybody else want to share something with me? Yes. Yes, sir. Let me just come in here. Hi. What's your name? Andy from Peacehaven. Hi, Andy. What have you noticed? The big plus is the confidence. The confidence? The confidence. When I actually leave the house now, I just feel really, really extra special about myself. Really? Yeah. Okay, what sort of things? I mean, how have you noticed that? Um, well, when I wake up in the morning, I look in the mirror, and I feel really good what I see now. Fantastic. As before, I couldn't even see myself in the mirror. Fantastic. <laughs> excellent. Okay, excellent. Okay, who else has got something they want to share with us? What sort of things have you noticed? Um, I've learnt... Um, to eat what you like the best first, because otherwise you leave it on the plate. <laughs> I've learned that from experience. Yes. Yes. I just feel so much better with this. Be mm. I, I went out for the first time in 12 years with my husband, and I really, really enjoyed it. I danced the night away. So you went out with him, and, and, and what yeah. do you think brought that about? Because I like me now. 
God, this is fantastic. I this love is all me very now. Good I can look stuff. in the mirror and I can go, yes. Yes, this Before, is Before, I just used to cry and go for the biscuits. Fantastic. This is great stuff. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that absolutely fantastic? Excellent. Okay, who else has got something they want to share with us? Anybody? Yes. Hello. What have you noticed? I've noticed a lot of the, the food that I used to love, I don't like so much. Okay. And a lot of the food that I, I didn't think I'd like, I actually like more. My taste buds have all changed. Your tastes have going. changed. You know, this is very common. People's preferences change because when you're consciously eating, you can actually taste the food. You see, before, if you were eating, say, a lot of fast food, you were getting high off the sugar and the salt. You were whacking it in fast. You couldn't really taste it. You were getting a hit from it. Suddenly, when you slow your eating speed, you get conscious. You go, oh, it doesn't quite taste so good. And then other things that perhaps you weren't actually stopping to enjoy, you now can really, really enjoy because you're consciously eating, yeah? Oh, definitely. Fantastic. Okay, some more. What about some more things? Yes, a lady here. Let me come round here. What sort of things have you noticed? Hi, what's your name? Hi, it's Janice from Ludlow in Shropshire. Hi, Janice. What have you noticed? I'm mentally more alert. Mm -hmm. I'm focusing more on my work. I'm able to concentrate more mm. because I'm not thinking about where the next meal is. Fantastic. This is brilliant. Anybody else got something they want to share with us? Cool. Yes, hello. Yeah. What's your name? Barbara. Barbara, where are you from? From Reading. From Reading. Hi. Mine's about timing. Yep. Um, I tend to find that if I was sitting at a table with guests around the table I yep. would feel ab and I've cooked the meal, I'd feel obliged to finish quickly in order to serve up the next course yes and so if you have somebody who's quite a quick eater at the table i would still go yeah. quite quickly i wouldn't like yeah. to indulge have the indulgence of time okay. to be able to enjoy that meal at the pace that i should be yeah. enjoying it okay now th this is an interesting question are there other people in the world who have people around for dinner who are thin yes and, OK, so it is possible, isn't it? But it yeah. might be that I'm more polite than they are. Yeah, or <laughs> it could be, it could be that, or it could just be that's the story you're telling yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, OK. So what I want you to do is be prepared to be a little bit rude, if you like. Can you do that? I can, certainly can. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's excellent. Very, very good one. OK. <laughs> you, what about, ah, I need a gentleman. Yes, sir. Hello. Hi there. Uh, what's your name? Oh, tell me a little bit about what you've discovered. Um, what I've found is that I'm using the tapping method that you did before. Yeah. Um, I've actually stopped smoking. I've not had a cigarette for a week now. And God, I've not even sort of thought about it. I did, first of all. I've had a couple. Yeah. I really wanted some. Um, but then I've used the tapping method. And, and it's just, just literally, it's just gone. I don't even want to have a cigarette at all. That so. is fantastic. Well, that is what it's designed for. What a brilliant success. OK, so, when we were actually... Coming up with the title for this show, we researched lots of different words and we found that words like slim and trim and fit were all words that people liked. But the one word that everybody felt was really powerful and applied to them was the word thin. That's what people want. They said, I want to be thin. And when we asked them, why do you want to be thin? They said, because I believe it will make me happy. Now, if we called this show... Paul McKenna will make you happy. I don't think we'd have so many people watching. I don't think so many of you would have bothered showing up. Isn't that interesting? Yeah? Because I know you want to be thin, but I want to make you happy. Well, I'm quite happy to do my best to make you thin. In fact, I think I can make you thin. But if all I did was make you thin and you weren't any happier, where would the freedom in that be? Yeah? Anybody here think that suddenly when you're thin, all your problems are just going to go away? Yeah? <laughs> Do you, do you think that there's a lot of thin people in the world who are not happy as well? Yeah? I think it's absolutely essential that as well as getting thinner, you get happy at the same time. The essential difference between my system and diets is that what makes the weight loss permanent is that my system will change you from the inside, make you think like a thin person, and boost your confidence. There'll be times when what you've learned so far isn't enough. I'm talking about times when you have a bit of a slip or when you binge. Now, unlike diets, this doesn't mean that it's all over because tonight I'm going to teach you how to take back control. Who here thinks that their weight has affected their confidence? Anybody think that? Okay. Okay, because low self-esteem is an issue for people that are overweight. In fact, Generally, people that are overweight feel that they have low self-esteem. So one of the ways they compensate for that is by overeating, which means they put on weight so it affects their self-esteem and so on. It's a vicious circle. Now, we're aiming to break that circle tonight because in just a moment, I'm going to show you one amazing technique to stop binge eating forever and a simple exercise to dramatically increase your self-confidence.
Plus, our fat-busting family got off to a cracking start, but will their success continue? If this takes me forever, then I will lose the weight. And find out how Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie and Catherine Zeta-Jones can help you keep the pounds off. you that I had a simple technique that meant that you'd never binge again. How many of you would be interested in learning that? Yes. yes. Now, I know quite a few of you like the tapping technique. Who like the tapping technique? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's still a few of you I know that are anxious around food. And if you binge, let me just tell you something. As far as I'm concerned, it's not your fault. It's not. It's the fault of your programming, the way your computer, your brain works, yeah? You weren't born a binger. Yeah? It was something you learned to do. If you learned it, you can unlearn it. Anybody like to tell me a binging story? Oh, hang on, there's one over here. One minute, let me just go over here. <laughs> Hello, madam. Hello. What is your name? My name's Nikki. Nikki, where are you from? From Kent. Nikki from Kent. Now, yeah. tell, tell me about your, one of your biggest binges. Basically, um, I'd been to one of these diet clubs, yep. put on a couple of pounds, and I thought, that's it, I've got to get rid of everything in the cupboards. Yep. So I ate them. I <laughs> ate the Terry's <laughs> chocolate oranges, the Twiglets, the crisps. Yeah. Bread and felt just in case you were tempted to eat yeah. it, you, you I thought I'd eat it rather than throw it away. Store it inside your body. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else done a sort of secret binge? You know, like late at night, do they have a secret stash or something? So yes, let me just shoot over here for a minute. Hello, sir. Hi. Hi. What's your name? My name's Bill from uh, East London. East London. Tell us about your binging. Two o'clock in the morning. All right. Yeah. Um, frozen ghetto. That's not quite soft yet. You know that lovely, oh, yeah. gooey, chocolatey one? Two o'clock is prime binge time, really, isn't it, for, for many of you? Creep, creep down, yeah. creep down to the kitchen. Yeah. Open the kitchen door. Yeah. Have the whole lot oh. on your plate. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. light came on. No. Wife came down. <laughs> I'm stark naked. <laughs> She's caught me. <laughs> Anybody else had anything else like that happen to them? <laughs> no, none of you. <laughs> the stark naked binge. Ah, let me come and talk to this lady in the middle. Can I just come past you then? Thank you very much. Hello, what's your name? Um, Emma from Southampton. Hi, Emma. So, Hi. tell us of your binging. Um, I've never been comfortable eating in front of people that I didn't know. So, right. on this particular occasion, I started a new job and I had a new boyfriend. And I was going out for dinner with him and some of my new work colleagues. So, I thought I'd have a little bit to eat before I went out. So, I didn't look ravenous when I was at the restaurant. And I also thought I'd have a little drink in the house before I went out, so I didn't look like an alcoholic. Of course. That's a good. <laughs> Get prepared, yes. So I ended up finishing off a bottle of white wine and about three meals' worth of food from my fridge, got out, had a, a nibble to eat in the restaurant and went to sleep at the table. <laughs> <laughs> OK, who here has binged? Yes, and who's prepared to forgive themselves? Excellent. There's a scientific reason why you have a need to binge eat. Take a look at this. According to a recent survey, up to 43% of us use food to alter our mood on a daily basis. A bad day at work, a boring meeting, a row with your partner. Uncomfortable emotions can find us battling the biscuit tin or stuffing down donuts. It's a learned response, but there is a way you can change it. Emotional eating is when people try to get rid of bad feelings by doing something quick that makes them feel good. So rather than have good relationships, they eat a piece of cake. Rather than, uh, you know, uh, kicking their bad boyfriend out, uh, you know, they have a box of chocolate. According to the experts, our relationship with food starts when we're babies. Have we been conditioned to do it from an early age? Absolutely. It's the very first thing that I think people do with babies is they don't know how to communicate with them. They, they're either too wet or they're too hungry or they're too tired or else they just don't know. So the first instinct is to check to see if they're wet. If they're not wet, you give them something to eat. Comfort eating is psychological and physical. People eat the kinds of food that's given them comfort psychologically in the past. You may give a child a chocolate bar as a treat when they're a child or a glass of pop as a treat on a Sunday. Now, actually, what that does is it reinforces that behaviour. But comfort eating is not only learned from childhood, it's also affected by chemicals in the brain, in particular the happy neurotransmitter serotonin. And food and mood are connected in a very complex way. 
Serotonin is particularly used within the limbic region of the brain. And this is the region of the brain to do with emotions, but also regulates our sleep, our sex lives, our libido, our appetite. And so you can see why these things are so closely linked together. So what that means is, if your brain chemicals are all over the place, then so are your emotions. To begin with, when people are comfort eating, usually it doesn't start with a feeling of comfort. It starts with a feeling, some anxiety feeling. So learning to, to shift the feeling of anxiety to some other feeling is going to make it so you don't think about eating so much. And that's going to depend upon whether the person is lonely or frustrated or depressed or just generally anxious. Dr. Richard Bandler has invented an amazing technique that changes the emotional response to food by imagining our feelings spinning in a different direction. Anxiety feels like a knot, but it's really rotating in one direction. So if you get people to rotate it bigger and stronger, it becomes intensified. If you slow it down or if you dislike it, reverse it, spin it in the other direction. It has a tendency to produce a different set of chemicals in the body. And these affect the, 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 the neural networks in the brain so that basically people can feel differently and behave differently. And we know that our brain chemicals and our emotions are linked together and both affect our appetite. Eating is learned behavior. And like any other behaviors, it can easily be changed. And when someone does change their behaviour to do with eating, this can have other effects, positive effects, on their everyday life. The spinning technique helps people because it gives them an example of where they can get control where they never thought they could. So it turns their hopelessness into something where they go, well, if I can do this, then I can do the rest of it. Now, Richard's technique is absolutely fantastic for changing any feelings. Uh, particularly, uh, he developed this for fear, for helping people turn fear around. And um, when any of us think about fear, usually it starts here in our tummy. You know, people often say, I've got a knot in my stomach or my stomach's churning. Think, think about uh, something that's quite frightening, just for a moment, yeah? Where does the feeling start? Just point to it, just show me, yeah? Yeah, for most people it is here. What happens? Does the feeling move up or does it move out to the surface of the skin? Just show me. Where's the general direction of the fear? Everybody just show me. Yeah, absolutely. It's very easy to notice with fear. Now, once we notice the direction a uh, feeling moves in, we can begin to imagine moving it in the opposite direction and reduce it and even negate it. And I particularly like using this for reducing and negating appetite. Okay, so who here wants me to help them stop binging. Who wants that help? Okay. Who'd like to help me with a technique? What about, what about you, madam? Come and join us. <laughs> Hi. What's your name? Mia. Mia, where are you from? Portsmouth. And when it comes to binging, something you do from time to time, is it? Yeah? Yeah. What is your particular uh, food of choice for binging? Chocolate gato. Chocolate gato. Okay, so uh, what I'd like you to do is put your attention in your body for a moment. So move it out of your head and be in, be in your tummy, in your body. Imagine I had a big chocolate gato here, yes? You can imagine. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Now, keep your attention in your body. Where, where does the feeling of desire start when I bring it closer? Mm -hmm. Starts with your tummy, yeah. yeah? And if I bring it in close, where does it move to? It's moving up. Move, moves up, yeah. So most people, it's like this, yeah? The feeling starts in their tummy, moves up, yeah? <clears throat> yeah? So let's get that chocolate gato and then bring, bring the feeling in, yes, mm -hmm. and it does that, yeah? The yeah. feeling. Because you see, if all we did was brought it in once and took it away, the feeling would fire off once. But if I bring it in and hold it like that, it keeps firing off so we see it like a wheel, yeah? We see it spinning that way, yeah? What colour shall we call this feeling of desire that you have for chocolate gatto? Red. Red, okay, fine. So you can feel that red feeling spinning as you look yeah. at the gatto. Okay, so what I want you to do is imagine that I've pulled that red feeling out here, yeah? Mm. You can see it spinning there in your imagination, yeah? So it's spinning like a red wheel, yeah? Okay, what I want you to do is now flip it over so it's going the opposite way, it's spinning down. Yeah. But let's turn it blue. Right. Turn it blue, and now I want you to pull it into you, feed it in through, through your neck and through to your chest, down into your tummy. Spin it in faster and faster and faster. Spin it faster and faster. Spin that blue wheel. That's it. Spin the feeling in. That's it. Spin it faster and faster and faster. There we go. Spin it faster. Whoosh, 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 whoosh. Whoosh, that's it. Spin it faster and faster. What's happening to the desire? Yeah. It's gone. Yeah, that's it. Spin the blue, but now bring in a lovely big gato. Spin the blue, spin the blue, spin the blue. That's it. Spin it faster and faster. Yeah, what's happening? You've got a blue feeling spinning, but look at the gato. Have you got desire going for the blue? Oh. No, no, no desire. That's it. That's it. 
spit it faster and it's faster. Gone. That's it. The feeling is gone. Oh, thank God for that. It's like exhausting <laughs> sex, isn't it? <laughs> Let me know when you're ready to go again. Okay. <laughs> isn't that interesting? We used the power of our imagination and, bam, took away a feeling of desire just like that. Pretty powerful, huh? Yeah. Yeah? Now, this is the really cool part. What we're going to do now is we are going to reprogram your mind through that visualization process. So, bring in a gato, get the feeling, the red feeling going again. You got the desire going? Yeah, there you go. Ooh, there you go. Let's pull it out. Nice red spin. Flip it over. Make it go blue. Pull the blue in. Put it in through your neck and all the way down into your chest and tummy. There we go. Fast, fast, fast. Spin that blue. Spin that blue really fast. That's a good. Keep spinning the blue. Okay, look at a gatto. You got any desire going for the gatto? Okay, spin the blue. Now, close your eyes and imagine everywhere where you would normally comfort eat any time you would ever binge and spin that blue and go into all of those situations and imagine being in all of those situations without comfort eating, without binging. There you go. And I tell you what, spin that blue and take it into every meal time as well. Let's reset all of the ways you relate to food. Spin that blue. There you go. Keep spinning it. Take it into all the places where you would normally eat. That's it. Take it into every meal time for the next seven days. Spin that blue feeling. And then when you've done that, open your eyes, come on back out. Now, when you think about being in those situations where you'd normally binge, and you imagine being there and not binging, what's it like? Mm, nice. nice. Yeah. Feeling control? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. We are going to do this process now. You can join in at home as well. What I would like you to do is to think about, um, first of all, put your attention in your tummy uh, and be in your body rather than up here in your head. And then think about a food that you really, really like, the kind of thing that you like to binge on, something that you use for comfort food, yeah? And as soon as you think about that, nice big plate of that, I want you to notice where the feeling starts and where it moves to. It will almost certainly start here in your tummy and move up, yeah? Show me. Everybody here in the audience, just show me, yeah? Show me where the feeling starts, where it moves to. Bring the food in. There you go. Show me. Where does it start? Where does it move to? There you go. Now, there are one or two people who, as we are doing this, are thinking, oh, for God's sake. I mean, this is absolute. You are the ones who most need to do this. <laughs> Now, what I want you to do is pull that feeling out and show me it spinning in front of you. Show me it. That's it. Like a wheel. There you go. Show me it. Now, I want you to flip the wheel over so it's spinning the other way, spinning down instead of up, and change the color of it. There you go. And now I want you to pull that wheel into you, that feeling into you, and spin it inside you in the opposite direction. Spin it now. That's it. Close your eyes and spin it now and feel it moving down through your throat, into your chest, into all all the way down into your tummy, that's it. Spin it wider and faster, there we go. If you're doing this at home, spin it faster and wider and stronger, that's it. Spinning it inside you, spinning it in the opposite direction, there we go. As soon as the feeling of desire has negated, stop, open your eyes, come on, back out. Now, this is what we're going to do next, is we're going to take that lack of desire into the environments where normally you would feel it. So, what I want you to do is think about the thing you desire. Yes, show me where the feeling of desire starts and where it moves to. Show me the spin, everybody. Show me where it starts, where it moves to. There you go. That's it. Good. Now, take the feeling out. Keep it spinning. Flip it over. That's it. So it's upside down. It's turning the other way around. Change the color of it. Pull it into you and spin it in the opposite direction. Do that. Spin it until the feeling of desire has disappeared. And at that moment, I want you to imagine being in all the different situations where normally you would comfort eat. That's it. Good. That's it. You are retraining your brain. You're spinning the feeling in the opposite direction. There's no desire going on. That's it. Fantastic. As soon as you've done that and you've negated the, the desire in those situations that you, that you want to, then just stop doing that, open your eyes, come on back out. Okay, so who now, when they think about situations where they would normally comfort eat or binge, finds that there's no desire? Show me. Fantastic. The Crisfords are our fat-busting family. They're a bit ahead of you in this process. This week they've been practicing the spinning technique. Let's see how they got on. Last week, we looked at the family's cravings and emotional hunger, and things seem to be improving. Now we're several weeks in, and I'm hoping that by now, they've seen some real results. I feel a whole lot more confident in wearing just clothes in general. I mean, some of the T-shirts that I've got, I never wore because they were starting to ride up my belly, but now they're starting to come back down again. My clothes are fitting better. Things that I would wear before but felt like I'd been put into with an icing bag, like a piping bag, now I can wear quite comfortably. The last time these jeans fitted me properly would have been 
about a year ago. On the whole, the family have noticed some weight loss and general improvement in their self-confidence. But Hayley's struggling. I get self-conscious even in front of my husband sometimes, you know, and he's always saying to be silly, loves me, etc, etc. But I just can't see sometimes how he can love me with the way I look. These levels of low self-confidence and poor body image that hayley has been experiencing can lead to attacks of binge eating. Thursday was a really, really bad day. I woke up in a really bad mood, had really bad backache, really bad tummy ache. The kids were playing me up and I really had had enough. I was bored and I felt really down. I just ate all the time. It didn't matter to me if I was hungry or not. I felt really bloated, really sick and really depressed because I've done it. Last week, Hayley was a little self-conscious about using the tapping method. This week, I want her to try another technique that should help her control her binge eating. I thought I was really hungry. I come out here, looked in the fridge and really, really fancied a sandwich. And then I decided, I, you know, I needed to find out if I was actually hungry or not. You spin this wheel and it goes round and round and round and round and round and then you slowly start to stop it and spin it backwards, pushing the hunger back down. That is a good technique. That does sort of drive away your, your anxieties about wanting to just grab anything that's in the fridge as you go past. Specific occasions where I use a spinning technique would be at work. I've got my lunch at work and I want it. The vending machine's out the back, I want something from it. So, yeah, I would use it at work. The techniques seem to be working for everyone, which will also have a positive effect on their confidence and energy levels. I feel good about myself the way I am now, even though I know there's going to be changes and that I am going to get a lot smaller. Feeling good about myself now is a, a real major point. I found that I've been quite motivated. A couple of times I have actually felt like going out and exercising. I'm a lot more active at work than I was, so I would spend a lot of time sitting down at work, whereas now I'm not. I spend a lot of time on my feet. I suppose really the self confidence has upped slightly because um, I wouldn't have gone out and up to the gym where all these thin people were, and I think they'd all be talking about me. Whereas now it's just I've made new friends, and they're not. They don't worry about what I look like. The Crispids are now over halfway through the program and are going from strength to strength. Next time we see them, it'll be for their final weigh-in and we'll find out just how successful they've been. And the Crispids are here with us. Tell me, how's it going? The whole uh, self-doubt and not believing in myself has completely changed. How about you? How are you doing? Your clothes, are they a bit looser? Yeah, I've moved down into my alternate set of clothes. <laughs> 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 Stuff that you put away and think, oh, I'll get back into that one day. Okay. And I am actually wearing some of it, so it was a good idea. So fantastic. <laughs> Now, what about Haley? Because you weren't so sure about the tapping, were you? And one of the great things with this approach is there are lots of different techniques you can use. So if you find that you don't like one, then there's usually another. What about the spinning? How's the spinning work for you? The spinning really works for me. Yeah. Uh, it really, really does work. I didn't find the tapping helps me at all. Right. But as soon as I feel like I need something, I, I spin it. I spin yeah. it and I decide whether I really actually want it. Yeah. When I spin it back down... It actually turns out I didn't want it in the first place. Yeah. Um, when I do actually want it, it stays there and then I have it. Excellent. When you're genuinely hungry, the desire will not disappear. Ultimately, it'll come back. But if it was just that you wanted to change the way you feel, bingo, then it goes. It yeah. Goes, it just disappears. Fantastic. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, the Crispids. <laughs> As I explained earlier, when we feel bad about ourselves, when we have low self-esteem, makes us want to eat. When we overeat, of course, gives us low self-esteem. And so the vicious circle continues. In a moment, I'll be showing you a technique that makes you feel so good about yourself, the urge to overeat will simply disappear. Plus, does your self-image affect your waistline? We reveal the startling results of our street experiment and discover exactly what Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, and Catherine Zeta-Jones can do for you. He was a famous plastic surgeon in the 1960s, a guy called Maxwell Maltz. And Dr. Maltz would do plastic surgery with people, and pretty much after each bit of surgery, he would find that his clients had a rise in self-esteem. However, there was a small proportion of clients that didn't matter how dramatic the surgery was on them, 
they didn't get any rise in self-esteem and he concluded that they were scarred on the inside. In other words, their self-image was a negative one. Now, I know that if you're overweight, the chances are that you also have, to some extent, a negative self-image. We want to change that. When you change the way that you think about yourself on the inside, the world changes, yes? It's like one big self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think of yourself as a, a capable person, guess what? You are a much more capable person. A positive self-image is crucial for long-term happiness, but it's also what makes you keep the weight off long-term. However, it's amazing just how harsh on ourselves we are. Body image is how we think and feel about our bodies, and it seems that very few of us are truly happy with the way we look in the mirror. Recent research found that we judge our own bodies far more harshly than we do other people's, so we really are our own worst critics. People form an image of themselves from quite a young age. They form it from how friends talk about them, how they're treated by their family and by their peers. If you're not happy with every aspect of your body, you're not alone. I don't like anything about me, actually. I really do criticise myself <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Everyone does, don't they? Maybe occasionally. No, I just don't look in the mirror. No, I think we're all too <laughs> overcritical of ourselves. Too fat, too old, too short. God, I'm ugly. Lines on my face. Yeah, my bum is quite big in comparison to me. I'm too old and too tired. I'm quite happy with myself, actually. I'm a little bit fat. I don't like my tummy. Probably for stomach reasons. Tubby around the middle area. Got to be a bit of a belly. Size of my legs, I suppose. Oh, my arms. There's no part of my body I'd like to exchange. I would like to change my size. Longer legs. I'd like to be taller. Everything. Maybe my nose. My nose. Smaller thighs. My legs. My legs. And maybe big and breasts. <laughs> Probably my boobs. Probably my legs and bum. I would like to change my backside. I hate my bum. <laughs> I'm being quite honest. <laughs> so where do people rate themselves on our scale? About two or three. Uh, two on the ugly side. On the beautiful side, obviously, yeah. <laughs> and I think I'm ugly, so... <laughs> oh, three, three, three. Two on the positive side. Plus five. I'd put myself to about number three. I'm more of a plus than a negative, I think. A negative three. I'd say plus five. Plus five? Minus one or two. Like that. Minus four. In our street experiment, we found that a massive 80% of people rated themselves lower than a 5 out of 10. It seems that whether you're fat or thin, short or tall, nearly everyone has issues with their body image. OK, so pretty much everybody criticises themselves. In fact, I've noticed that most people do it as part of some daily ritual. Start the day by looking in the mirror. Oh, look, I look so fat and ugly and obese. And then going off out for the day, yes? <laughs> Spending the rest of the day trying to compensate. You know all those small criticisms? They add up, yeah? So who'd like to have a rise in self-esteem? Who'd like to help me with this demonstration? You, madam. Yes, you. That's right. Come and join me, please. Let's give her a nice round of applause. Hello. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Linda. Linda, where are you from? West Midlands. OK. You give yourself a tough time when you look in the mirror? Yes, very. Are you a little bit nervous because guess what I have here? Oh, my God. Yes. I know. But how would you like to feel better when you look in the mirror in future? It'd be nice. It'd be nice. Mm. OK. Now, Linda, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to take us into your objective world of criticism when you look in the mirror, uh, because I've noticed that everybody makes certain observations about themselves, and they usually do it in a sequence. Their eye goes to a particular place, you make a criticism, then it moves somewhere else, another criticism, and so on and so on, yeah? OK, so here we go. Look in the mirror. Tell me out loud, what do you see? Oh, God. What do you say? Fat. Ugly. Yep. Obese. I can see my stomach, my my belly, my legs, the thickness of them. The, the f they're just the fat all around my face and my neck and my okay. arms. That'll do. Okay. So, um, if we were to um, put you on a perceptionometer, something we've got here. Uh, one side is ugly. Ten is the most ugly anyone could possibly be. The other side is beauty. Ten's the most beautiful. Where are you? Oh, definitely the ugly. Definitely the ugly? And what number would you be right now? 
Eight, nine. You'd be an eight or nine on the ugly side. By the way, when you do that, do you start the day on a big up? You go, oh, look, I look so fat and ugly and obese. Does that start your day on a positive note? No. No! OK. Now, if you are going to talk nonsense like that to yourself, I don't think you should be able to take it seriously. What I want you to do in just a moment is to look at yourself, and I am going to say... Um, a sentence at a time, and as soon as I've done it, you repeat it inside your head in exactly the same tone of voice. I I'm obese. <laughs> I have a fat stomach. <laughs> I look at my fat belly. <laughs> look at my fat legs. <laughs> it makes my fat neck. OK, stop. <laughs> now, when you talk to yourself like that, what's the difference? It makes it more funny. It makes it more funny. The next time you go to say, fat, ugly, obese, all of that, I want you to hear it like that. Now, we want to move to a place of greater self-acceptance. Doesn't mean you don't want to change. You can lose weight, but you've got to accept this is where you're at now. Yes? Okay. Is that cool? Okay. I once again repeat this inside your mind in exactly the tone of voice I use. Ready? Look at yourself. I accept my face. I accept my neck. I accept my stomach, I accept my belly, I accept my legs, I accept myself. Stop. Ooh, something different's happened to you. Anybody notice it? Yeah? Suddenly there's not this tension going on. You're much more relaxed. Let's just have a little look on the perceptionometer. Have we shifted somewhere? Uh, are we less ugly than we thought a few minutes ago? A three. A three. Nice. Let's move it to a three. Ooh, we're getting somewhere now, eh? OK. Uh, let's borrow from the beauty of somebody else, shall we? Who's a particularly beautiful person, sort of iconically beautiful? Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer. I'd like you to imagine Michelle Pfeiffer standing here, yeah? Yeah? Close your eyes and step into Michelle Pfeiffer. Take a physical step forward. Now, how does Michelle Pfeiffer feel on the inside? She feels good about herself. She feels good about herself. What does she say? What does her internal dialogue say? She likes the way she looks. Where does she feel that, that feeling of confidence strongest in her body? Up here. I up think, here, in the yeah. Head and the yeah. Give it a colour, move it up to the top of your head, move that colour down to the tip of your toes. Double the brightness, double it again. OK, now, staying within Michelle Pfeiffer's perspective, I want you to open your eyes and just look into your eyes. Just look into your eyes now. Hold that posture. That's it. Good. Hold it. Ooh, that's different. Nice. OK, now, where have we just shifted to on the perceptionometer? Have we gone into beauty yet? A one. You're at a one on the beauty. It's moving in the right direction. I'd like you to remember a time that, that somebody paid you a compliment. Now, it can be this kind of thing. Now, the sort of thing I like is this. Something like, oh, my friend thinks you look hot. And you have a sort of cheeky walk for about half an hour. <laughs> yeah? That's okay. So what I want you to do is close your eyes and return to that time right now. Are you back there now, reliving it like it's happening all over again? Tell me if you are. Just give me a nod. That's yes. it. Yeah, good. Open your eyes, look at yourself in the mirror and replay that compliment. There you go. Anybody see the difference? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. OK, now, on the perceptionometer, where are we now? Are we in the beauty at all? Five, six on the beauty. Five, six. All right, we'll say five. From, from, the, from the memory, that is. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's all just perception. I don't know if you've noticed that there are some people in the world who really are not that attractive but are convinced they are really good-looking. Yeah. And they've got no bloody right to. You know this <laughs> Now, what I'm thinking is, if that's a disorder, I want it! <laughs> I want you to get good at taking a compliment, yeah? 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 Okay. I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine standing in front of you is somebody who you know loves and respects you. I don't know if it's your husband, I don't know if it's your kids. Float out of your body and float into theirs and look at yourself through their eyes. Look at yourself through the eyes of love. And see all the things that they notice in you that perhaps you haven't noticed in yourself until now. And fill yourself with that love. And send it up to the top of your head, down to the tip of your toes. Double it and then open your eyes and look at yourself. What do you see? More beauty. More beauty. Fantastic. Where are we on the uh, perceptionometer? <laughs> A nine. A nine? <laughs> Fantastic. You are beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, the neat thing is, is we want to catch ourselves from going into the old, automatic, abusive kind of stuff first thing in the morning, saying horrible things to ourselves. Yeah? If we find ourselves doing that, they want to do to their silly eyes. Yes? So make it so we can't take it seriously. Next, I want you to close your eyes and remember a time somebody, if it's safe and appropriate to do so, close your eyes and open, but remember a time someone paid you a compliment and you knew they were sincere. And remember that time. That's it. Make the colours rich and bright and bold. Make the sound loud. Make the feeling strong. As soon as it finishes, go through it again. Keep going through that memory again and again and again and again and again and again. That's right. And fill yourself up with that good feeling. There we go. And what I want you to do is I want you to imagine right now you're looking at yourself in the mirror and send that good feeling to yourself. And then open your eyes and come on back out. Okay, every morning before you look in the mirror, I want you to generate that good feeling, yeah? Remember the good time, and only then look in the mirror, yeah? Get the good feeling going first. Now, there's something else I want you to do, and I'd, I'd like you all to stand up for this, please. What I want you to do is think about somebody who's a role model for you, and imagine they are standing in front of you, and then I want you to step into their body. So, I'm going to pick, I don't know, Sean Connery, so... <laughs> step in. <laughs> Yeah. Okay? And I want you to copy their posture. Copy the posture. Copy the posture. Here you go. Hello, who are you? Carol Vorderman. Carol Vorderman, yeah. <laughs> Gotta go. How, how does Carol feel on the inside? She's just feeling fantastic. Fantastic, yeah. Okay, who else? Who, who we got here? Victoria Beckham. Victoria Beckham, <laughs> excellent. How does she feel? Wonderful. Wonderful, <laughs> excellent. Okay, let me just walk up here. Here's somebody. Hello. Hello. Who, who, oh, hello. Who are you? My name's Marion. Ma yeah, who, who are you? <laughs> oh, no. Who have you stepped into? Who's your role model? Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah. Show us the posture. What's Michelle Pfeiffer's posture? Give, give me the posture. How's she stand? That's it, yeah. That's all right. That, that, that. It's a little bit more Sam Fox. No. That's so, so. Keep, keep. Close your eyes and imagine you stepped into Michelle Pfeiffer. That's it. Eyes closed, step into the posture. There we go. Good. Okay, good. Let me just have a little look over here. Okay, remember, that's it. I want you to be in the posture. There we go. That's it. Okay, good. Now, I want you to remember that time you were paid the compliment. Just close your eyes and remember it again and again and again. As soon as you get the body posture really good, the feelings start to come. You start to get the confident feelings as well. What I want you to do is remember that time you were paid the compliment, and then every morning, whenever you look in the mirror, copy this posture, remember the compliment, and only then look at yourself in the mirror, yeah? Constantly associate good memories and good postures to yourself whenever you look in the mirror. Okay. And then open your eyes, come on back out. Who feels good? Yes! Give yourselves a round of applause. Have yourselves a seat back down. Thank you very much. Okay, to lose weight and keep it off permanently, you need to do all of the system. Next week, I'm going to show you how to speed up metabolism, how to get totally motivated to take exercise, and we'll find out the results of our mass weigh-in. Remember, three weeks ago, you guys weighed in at... 3,290 stone! Is that going to change? Find out next week! techniques are wacky, but I think sometimes wacky works. During the mirror technique, I didn't feel for myself that my own self-image improved. I felt that I went up from a, a minus six, probably to plus two or three. I can't wait for the next show. I'm looking forward to that immensely. Hopefully this is going to be the first day of the rest of my life. If you ever eat out of boredom, stress or frustration, then tonight you can learn how to conquer comfort eating for good. We'll be revealing the science behind food cravings and learning an amazing technique to instantly banish them forever. Plus, how you can stop fixating about food and take back control as you learn to switch off cravings. Are you ready? To lose weight forever, to feel better about yourself, to escape your fixation with food. This is not a diet. You can join in and make this Britain's biggest weight loss experiment. All you have to lose is weight. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul McKenna. Is feeling differently about their food. Yeah!
Fantastic. That's absolutely what I wanted to hear, what I wanted to see. Welcome to week two. I will make you thin. By taking part, you are making this the world's biggest weight loss experiment. So if you've only just joined us, if you've you know, missed last week's show, don't worry. You can still join in. Here's a quick reminder of the four golden rules, the first stage of this system. Last week, I revealed the four golden rules of naturally thin people. As you follow my simple instructions, it'll change the way you feel about food forever. Golden rule number one, when you're hungry, eat. When you starve yourself, your body goes into survival mode. It slows your metabolism and stores fat in your cells. From now on, you need to let your body know there'll always be enough food. Never, ever starve yourself ever again. Golden rule number two, eat what you want, not what you think you should. When you make a food forbidden, it instantly becomes more attractive. Never let food have power over you again. If you want something, have it. Golden rule number three, eat consciously and enjoy every mouthful. Put your knife and fork down between each bite so that you give your stomach time to signal to your brain that you're full. In our experiment, we blindfolded a group of volunteers and they were forced to listen to their stomachs. And as a result, they ate less. Golden rule number four, when you think you're full, stop eating. When you slow your eating speed down, you can hear the signal from your tummy that lets you know you're full. Follow the four golden rules. When you're hungry, eat. Eat what you want. Eat consciously. And when you think you're full, stop. Remember, this is the way that naturally thin people eat. For the next few weeks whilst you're getting used to this system, I want you to always leave some food on your plate. And do not weigh yourself. Okay, those four golden rules are so easy. In fact, a lot of people say to me, I, I can't believe it's that easy because, you know, they've tried to diet for many years and, of course, weight loss was difficult. And this system seems almost too good to be true. Now, even though you may have had instant success using the golden rules, you need to use the entire system to maintain permanent weight loss. This is not a diet. This is a unique system that will change the way that you think about food forever. It requires no willpower. All you have to do is follow my simple instructions. Who wants to share with me what it is that they've noticed? Yes, let me have a quick chat with you, madam. I'm just gonna come through here. Hi, what's your name? Emma. What's been happening for you? Over the last few days, I've felt a lot more relaxed around food. I have eaten some lovely food and not eaten too much of it. Fantastic, so you've been leaving food on your plate? Yes. Yeah, who else has been leaving food on their plate? <laughs> Excellent. Who also has found that uh, they've eaten so slowly that sometimes the food's gone cold? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to share with me some stories about what's been happening for them? What's your name, ma'am? My name's Anne. And what have you been noticing? Um, I've been eating foods that I haven't been anywhere near for years and years and years, but I'm concerned that I have taken it perhaps a little bit too far. H OK. Um, how have you taken it too far? Um, I have bought uncut wholemeal bread. <gasps> and I have cut these <laughs> slices. We have a sinner amongst us. <laughs> <laughs> and I thoroughly uh, enjoyed it, but I haven't. Uh, uh, no, that's even worse. Not only did you eat it, <laughs> you thoroughly enjoyed it. I tell you, dear old Dr. Atkins had turned in his grave. <laughs> and, uh, and I've had it with butter and yeah. a oh. nice bit of blue, <laughs> bit of blue cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, mm. it, and it was lovely. Mm. Um, you, you sound like you're confessing to some indecent <laughs> pornographic act, <laughs> don't you? Yeah. Did it feel good? Oh. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> If somebody's just joined the program at this point, let me let say we're talking about foods, okay? It's not what you might think, okay? Now, the thing is this, uh, did you eat it consciously? Oh, very consciously. Yes, okay. And then when you were full, what did you do? I stopped. Stopped. Did you leave any? Only the very littlest bit, just to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> but you did leave some. I did, yeah. <laughs> OK, good. So you left some food on your plate. Now, the thing is this. Um, how do you feel around food? Do you feel more in control or less in control? Much more in control. Fantastic! Yes! Yeah. That's what we want to hear. OK. Excellent. OK, let's, uh, let's talk to somebody else. Let's talk to you, ma'am. OK. Hello. Hello. Hi, what's your name? Mary. Mary, what have you noticed? I'm enjoying the taste 
of food more. And I'm also noticing when maybe I thought I used to like something, I'm thinking, oh, mm, actually, now I'm tasting it, it's not quite as nice. Oh, brilliant. This is excellent. Who else has noticed that since you consciously and deliberately chew the food, the food tastes better? Anybody else notice that? Excellent. We know from the emails that over 90% of the people here have had a positive experience with this system. OK, who else has got something they want to share with me? And I don't mind if it's a positive thing, if it's a challenge you're facing, anything. Yes, hello, ma'am, what's your name? My name's Veronica, I'm from Middlesbrough. Hi, Hi what, uh, what did you notice? The food thing is fine. I can cope with everyday foods, doing the knife and fork, yeah. everything like that. It's the other things I can't break the habit with. OK, wh As which in other things? Sweets and crisps. Sweets and crisps, yeah, I can, okay. The food, I can put the knife for, I can chew it, I enjoy it. New textures that are coming out, mm. brilliant. Mm. Sweets and crisps, mm. I cannot do. OK, so when you get around sweets and crisps, what happens? Do you tend to binge or go unconscious? I, or? I just go on autopilot. I just want them. I you see just, them, I want them, I'm you having them. You see them, you want them, and, and do, you, them. do you eat them consciously or not? Sometimes, yes. A lot of time, no. no. I don't even okay. realise sometimes I'm actually doing it. Ah, here we go. Fantastic. Does anybody else resonate with this? Yes. <laughs> OK. All right. That is what tonight's show is about. It's all about comfort eating, you know, all about those, uh, uh, those moments where you, you feel addicted to a particular food. You see it, you just have to have it. And you feel like you've lost all conscious control. Yeah? It's, it's almost as though you've been taken over by some sort of force. Well, you have to have it. Yes? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. OK. Yeah. You are going to love tonight's show. OK. I'm just going to come, come talk to you. Hello. Hi. Hello. What's your name? Michelle. Michelle from? Essex. Michelle, uh, what challenges have you noticed? Um, the only one challenge I did have was um, a certain tub of ice cream that you eat with a spoon. Yep. Um, I have only done it once, yeah. and I knew I was doing wrong, and I knew I shouldn't be doing it, <laughs> but I put it back in the freezer and got it out three times, <laughs> and the dust been empty. <laughs> so there was no control over that whatsoever, but everything else I've okay. been able to control, well, but there was no control. Do you know, you see, I think there was a certain degree of control, because in the good old days, you wouldn't have put it back in the freezer at all, would no, you? Wouldn't. You'd have just finished the whole lot, right? You'd have spanked the whole tub of ice cream. But what you did was you put it back in, and you went, oh, I was having some more. Yeah, and you did that a few times, yeah? Three times. Three times. Okay, so can you forgive yourself? Yes. Excellent, that's fine, because tonight, that is what we are going to be dealing with. Those foods that we find we get out of control around, yeah, the ones we have cravings or addictive patterns around, we're going to be dealing with that. The other, I just want to ask you on the positive side, though, have you been putting knife and fork down? I've been doing all of that. Yeah? I've been doing all that. And, and you've been leaving food on your plate? Leaving food. I feel fantastic. I feel better in myself. Fantastic. Calm around food, I've got control back. Great, fantastic. Who else would say that they feel calmer around food? Show me. This is fantastic. Now, I know there that we've been talking about forbidden foods. Remember, there are no real forbidden foods with this system. And it's not really what you eat, but it's how you eat that, that's important. OK, who wants to knock out cravings for good? Yes! Tonight, I'm going to teach you two powerful techniques which will do just that, which will work for food, for actually just for anything, for smoking and drinking, basically any addiction. Join me in a moment, and I'll share those techniques with you. Still to come, Lizzie, a four-litre-a-day cola addict, easily went from this to this. Really good. Our fat-busting family, the Crisford's portion sizes and waistlines, are undergoing a major transformation. And find out how you can instantly switch off any craving forever. Would you like some of this? No. You sure? No, thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Tonight we are dealing with emotional hunger, uh, what is otherwise known as comfort eating. Anybody ever eat where they feel uh, bored yes. or they feel upset or they feel stressed? I don't know why they call it comfort eating because the more you eat, the tighter your clothes get, the less comfortable you are. <laughs> you know, there's nothing comfortable about your belt cutting into your clothes, is there? You know what it's like? You've anybody broken up with somebody and they thought, I know what will make me feel better, a lovely big chocolate cake. Yeah? Anybody had that kind of experience? <laughs> so, who here like to share with me a little comfort eating story? Tell me, I mean, what sort of things have you done in the past? Yes. Hi, what's your name? And my name is Tinky. Tinky, tell us a comfort eating story. Um, I'll sit down with a good film, watching mm. the film, and my, my hand is constantly going to my mouth, and it will be nuts. Yeah. That is my thing. Easy. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry can, I, can I clarify? <laughs> 
<laughs> what you mean, that's how you class the behaviour or that's what you're putting in your mouth? Both! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm nuts and I like nuts. Yeah, OK. <laughs> so the thing is, you're unconscious because you're watching the movie and you're shoveling yeah, away. Absolutely. absolutely. Without even knowing about yeah. it and then the yeah. pain's gone. Who else has done these kind of things, yeah? Exactly. All in the same boat. Hi, what's your name? Mia. Tell us about your comfort eating. Well, I've got a quite demanding and stressful job. Yep. And I've got a secret stash of chocolate in my drawer. A secret stash? Yeah. And so when you get under stress, that's what you use mm. to help calm yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Anybody else? What about there's somebody over here? Hello, ma'am. What's your name? Valerie. And Valerie, tell us about your comfort eating. Um, mine is when I'm left alone. Yes. If I'm, and at my at home when I'm left Do alone. You feel bored or lonely? Uh, or? It's a sort of kick. I yeah. get a kick and it doesn't really matter what I eat. Yeah. As long as I go and find something to eat. So, so there's no one there. No. And you can go and eat all by yes. yourself. And I know exactly how long my husband takes to walk the dog. <laughs> <laughs> I, know it's, I know exactly how long I've got. <laughs> well, up until now, because he's just seen you confess that on television. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> <laughs> OK. All right, so we got the general idea. So when I talk about emotional hunger, it's different to physical hunger. Physical hunger comes on gradually. Slowly you feel yourself becoming a little bit more and more and more hungry. Emotional hunger comes on suddenly. Anybody had the experience of, say, uh, having an argument with somebody and you wanted to go and eat to calm yourself down? Anybody had that? Or maybe, I don't know, you got home, you felt a bit lonely, a bit sad, and you suddenly wanted to eat. Anybody had that? Yes? OK. What we are doing there is changing the way that we feel with food. Now, in our culture, there are lots of ways to change the way that we feel externally. Drinking, drug-taking, television, gambling, shopping, and indeed food are all ways of external Internally, changing the way we feel. But you see, our emotions are part of our intelligence. They're actually a signaling system. Our emotions are there to say to us, pay attention to this. If we're about to, you know, step off the curb and there's a car coming, we want an emotion that says, <gasps> that stops us from doing something that's dangerous. However, sometimes our emotions signal a bit too loudly, particularly if we've been suppressing them. And that's what's happening in many cases. We've been medicating ourselves with food instead of listening to the wisdom of our feelings. So instead of asking, what is it I should eat? Maybe you should be asking, what's eating me? Now, there's a scientific reason why we respond to strong emotions by craving certain foods. Have a look at this. At some time or another, everyone will have experienced a craving. That's an overwhelming urge to eat something stodgy, sweet or fatty. Usually, cravings have to be satisfied straight away, and most people find controlling them extremely difficult. Certain chemicals in the brain trigger these urges, and one in particular has a powerful influence on what we eat. Serotonin is known as the happy chemical, really, within the brain. Levels of serotonin correspond with feelings of relaxation, calmness, helping us cope with stress. And it's foods high in carbs that give us that serotonin fix. When we crave certain foods, it's often a sign that our serotonin levels in the brain are low. When we eat that food, carbohydrates, this raises our levels of serotonin within the brain. But it's a vicious circle, because the serotonin is often an indication of anxiety, and we feel bad because we've got low levels of serotonin, and therefore we, we crave the food to make us feel better. But it's not only serotonin that affects our cravings. There's another powerful chemical at work. Cravings feel like an uncontrollable urge because of the levels of dopamine within the brain. Dopamine is the substance in the brain to do with addiction. And so in a sense you can become addicted to carbohydrates because your brain produces more dopamine when you come into contact with carbohydrates. But now there's an extraordinary technique that instantly stops cravings. Dr Colin Barron has been a conventional hospital doctor and he's also a leading practitioner in thought field therapy known as TFT. Thought field therapy is a technique for the rapid elimination of all kinds of emotional distress which works by tapping with the fingers like this on the energy meridian points of the body. If that sounds too good to be true, it's not exactly a new idea. The energy meridian system, or the pathways of energy that run around the body, were discovered by Chinese healers around 3,000 years ago and forms the basis of acupuncture and other alternative therapies. What we are doing when we carry out a TFT treatment is, in effect, we are entering a healing code into the body's energy meridian system. It's like entering a PIN code, which eliminates the negative emotion. 
The theory is that all cravings are caused by anxiety. This negative emotion increases the stress hormones and decreases the levels of the happy chemical serotonin. Using TFT, we rebalance ourselves so that those feelings of anxiety that cause cravings are replaced by a sense of calm and well-being. Well, what happens during a TFT treatment is that uh, levels of certain chemicals like adrenaline, noradrenaline, tend to decrease, as does cortisol, and levels of so-called happy chemicals like serotonin tend to increase. Techniques like tapping help the person because it gives them back control. And if they can have control over one aspect of their life, they learn that they can have control over all aspects of their life. And by eliminating this craving and treating the underlying anxiety, we can help people to regain their healthy weight. Now, the tapping technique that we were referring to there was developed by a brilliant American scientist called Dr. Roger Callahan, and he has discovered that the brain is like a computer and it has its own software. And when we tap on various acupuncture points while thinking about what it is that's stressing us out or what it is that we're craving, we literally overwrite the operating software of our brains. Lots and lots of doctors use this TFT technique. I have used it with just about everyone in recent years, with internationally renowned athletes, with actors, with musicians, with royalty. And I want to use it with you. It's absolutely fantastic. I think everybody should learn this in school. It's, it's so, so powerful. It kills cravings and compulsions like that. What I'd like you to do is just make yourself comfortable. And I want you to think about something that you feel a compulsion around. So what I'd like you to do in just a moment is to think about your craving and then rate it on the scale of 1 to 10. Who's got one that's like an 8, 9 or 10? Yeah! That's right, that's what we want. Okay, so I want you to continually think about your craving, concentrate on the feeling of the craving whilst we tap on the various TFT acupuncture points. Ready? Everybody think about the craving and tap about 10 times above one of your eyes. Tap under the eye. Tap the collarbone. Tap under the arm. Tap the side of the hand here, karate chop point. Think about what it was you were craving, tapping here. Tap the back of your hand here, there we go. Now, close your eyes, open your eyes. Keep your head still, look down to your right. Keep thinking about what it is you're craving. Keep your head still, look down to your left. Okay, now, keep tapping the back of your hand. Keep thinking about what it was you were craving. Now, rotate your eyes 360 degrees in a circle, still tapping the back of your hand. Rotate your eyes 360 in the opposite direction, still tapping the back of your hand. Hum the bars of Jingle Bells. Mm -mm 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 Count out loud from one to five. One, two, three, four, five. Tap above the eye again. There we go. Tap under the eye. Now, take a new reading. Who's got a craving that's less than what they started with? Yeah, just about everybody. Isn't that extraordinary? Now, some people say, hang on a minute. You've just distracted me, that's all it is. <laughs> well, of course, if it was a distraction, it would come right back, wouldn't it? Yeah. Try and get it back. Oh, <laughs> yes, I know. When I first discovered this technique, I was a little bit annoyed because I had spent years learning how to help people change through various psychological techniques, and then apparently all you do is go, nah, 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 and you feel better. <laughs> but I've got to tell you, it absolutely works. By the way, there are lots of other uses for this. I mean, for example, you can sit like this in your office all day long <laughs> and no one will bother you. You can get on public transport without a newspaper to avert eye contact from the lunatic. Yeah, no newspaper needed. You, you can be sitting there, the lunatic can get on the bus or the train. And you can be sitting there. So the thing is, this looks a bit weird, but I promise you it works, and it works very, very well. Now, I know that a lot of you will have questions about this, so who wants to ask me anything about this? Yes, ma'am. How long have I got to do this tapping for? Okay, I would say that it's highly unlikely you're going to need to tap for more than a couple of minutes. In fact, the more often you do this, the quicker the craving will disappear. Who else has a question? Yes. How do you know if you're tapping in the right place? OK, it doesn't matter if it's not exactly the right place, but the sequence that I just went through with you is the algorithm that Professor Callahan came up with for compulsions and addictions. Yeah? OK? What about over here? Can I overuse the technique? No, you okay. can't. No. Okay. 
All you could do is if you kept tapping for too long, your head might feel a bit sore. <laughs> But you can't, you can't overdo it, you can't do yourself any harm with this. It's been thoroughly tested, it's completely safe. OK, sir? Should you use that technique just when you fancy something or when you really, really feel that you've got to have it? Yeah, it's more when you've got to have it, when you feel out of control around something. Yeah. We want it so you can look at food and take it or leave it. So if you feel out of control, tap the thing away. After you've done that several times, you'll be back in control. You've now got an extremely powerful technique, which means that you'll never be beaten by cravings again. And if you need further evidence of just how effective it can be, take a look at Lizzie. 27-year-old Lizzie Davis weighs 17 stone. Her cravings for fizzy cola have turned into an obsession that's ruining her life. It's getting late to give you I feel like an addict. A total addict. But one that people make fun of. It's lonely, it's taken over me. I think the need for cola has taken over most of my life. She drinks a massive four litres of cola every day. Me. That adds up to a tooth rotting three kilograms of sugar each week. My teeth are in a terrible state. I think I've had about 20 fillings. I've had to have veneers on my teeth and an implant because this tooth had died. But it's not just the cost to her health. To support her cola habit, unemployed Lizzie's bank balance is taking a battering to the tune of 1,500 pounds every year. I could go on holiday with that. I don't believe that. Lizzie's cravings kick in early. It's cornflakes and cola for breakfast. Well, the first sip of the day is perhaps the best sip. The taste is amazing, especially when it's ice cold. It tastes beautiful, and the fizziness will go down your throat. And about two seconds after you, I've had a sip, I'm happy. But that high doesn't last. I find it very hard to stop, and I can't take anything else. Lizzie craves cola because her body's got used to a certain high level of carbohydrates within it, and therefore for her to produce the normal levels of dopamine and serotonin, she needs an excessive amount of carbohydrates. This is a woman who experiences powerful daily cravings. We've asked her to go cold turkey to find out just how much these cravings have taken over her life. Oh, this is sacrilege. <laughs> this isn't right. To monitor her stress levels, we've also asked Lizzie to record her heart rate throughout the experiment. It's day one, and Lizzie's anxiety levels have rocketed. My mind is slowly going, I want some drink, I want some drink, I want some cola, and I want it now. The average heart rate at rest is between 60 and 80 beats per minute. During the day, Lizzie's heart rate soars to 116 beats per minute, even at rest. I'm in a really bad mood. I want to scream. And on day two, things go from bad to worse. She's feeling very depressed and experiencing extreme withdrawal symptoms. <sighs> Just been sick. Really sick. Symptoms of withdrawal often include headaches, sickness, shaking, feeling high levels of anxiety, because levels of serotonin and dopamine, if they're not balanced, make us feel anxious. I'm not looking forward to the rest of the day. I want to spend the day in bed. If I put any clothes on to go out, I will go out and I will buy cola. I know that, and I have to stay in. For the first time in three days, Lizzie finally summons up enough courage to leave the house. I'm sweating like mad. I can't believe I've done this. Feeling really nervous, like I want to go home, like I'm having an anxiety attack. That's because I haven't had any cold. I'm feeling like this. I know it. That's exactly why I'm feeling like this. By the end of day three, Lizzie's cravings are so bad, she just can't cope. That's all I can think of is cola. And I don't want to. I don't see it getting any better at the minute. I'm just, I feel like I've lost. There's no fight left in me. But there's an easy way to eradicate those cravings for good. To help Lizzie beat her cravings, I'm going to talk her through the tapping technique. Hello. Tap above one of your eyes. Just one of the eyebrows, yeah? Tap above one of the eyebrows about ten times. Keep concentrating on the craving. It's an absolutely extraordinary technique. It looks a bit weird, but it works really well. Thank you. Bye. 
After just a few minutes of tapping, Lizzie is totally transformed. She's gone from this to this. <laughs> and her mom really is good. just as relieved as she is. Yeah. She's more relaxed looking. Very happy. It's gone. I don't feel any craving. So as a final test, Lizzie takes a trip to her local pub, where she's ordered nothing but cola for the past decade. Hi, could I have some orange juice, please? Orange juice? Orange juice please. On a scale of 1 to 10, my craving for cola was about 5, just before I ordered my orange juice. Before I came in, I found a quiet place and went and tucked, and I did that twice, and then come in and everything was fine. It's been so easy, easier than I thought. I thought it would be hours worth of trying to work out something every day, um, not realising it would be minutes, and feeling the benefit in minutes. On a scale of 1 to 10, I feel 10 of happiness. <laughs> I feel really good, I'm proud of myself and enjoying orange juice and feeling much happier. I would say to anyone sceptical to try it, it will work. I'm living proof of that. Lizzie's here with me now. Lizzie, when you were watching that tape just now, you got quite emotional. Yeah. What was it like looking at the old Lizzie? It was seeing an addict of something that someone who... Sorry. That's right. It's um, OK. It was like seeing so who I was and not liking what i seen. Yeah. At all. And seeing my mum's face when she seen me. Yeah. And the emotions I felt back then at yeah. the time just come back as well. How long has it been since you've had any cola? It's been three weeks, nearly a month. Three weeks, nearly a month. That's fantastic. Well done. Now, that is why I think this technique is so powerful. Because every now and again, you'd get a craving, mm -hmm. right? And what, what would you do? I'd do the techniques. I'd do the tapping. You'd sit there and tap. And how long would it be before, before the craving would go away? Usually four minutes at the most. Four minutes at the most. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you just tap and tap and tap and sometimes tap and tap. Sometimes it there. would be once. You just tap one yeah. sequence and it's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you look at the old you, how do you feel about that old addicted you? <laughs> I feel pity for her. Yeah. That's what I did. And now I'm, I feel much better and I'm actually proud of myself. OK, what other differences have you noticed in yourself? That I can control everything I do. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to eating or what I want to drink. Um, I can enjoy my meals with yeah. just water, which yeah. I didn't think I could do. Yeah. And I've lost a lot of weight already. Really? Yeah. Do, do you know how much weight you've lost? No, I haven't weighed myself. OK, good. <laughs> But the I've clothes lost, are looser, I've are lost a dress size already. Fantastic. Yeah. That is tremendous. <laughs> now, everybody here and watching tonight at home will have at some point lost control around food. Tonight, we're going to take back that control and make sure that you're never fixated by food ever again. So if you genuinely want to look at this and take it or leave it, find out how in just a moment. Coming up, will the Craving Buster technique work for the Crispers? Discover how to wipe out your fixation with food forever. And learn how to crank up your happiness so you'll never need to comfort eat again. I'm on a quest to find out how much pleasure one human being can stand. <laughs> Welcome back. We've been following the Crisford family, who are a little bit ahead of us on the weight loss system. This week, they've been putting the craving buster techniques into practice. Let's see how they got on. Welcome back, our fat-busting family, the Crisfords. Now they've got to grips with the four golden rules, they're beginning to see some amazing changes. It isn't really eating something that's different, because I eat exactly the same food. It's just that I mark it in smaller portions of it and fewer times. I'm cooking my dinner. I'm only eating for about a quarter of my dinner, and then I'm absolutely full. Two weeks ago, a typical day would include a couple of pizzas, a loaf of bread, three or four packets of crisps, eggs, sausages, beans, and a mountain of bacon. I'm really quite surprised at the amount of bacon that I used to eat. To go from that to that is... A big drop. But if there's going to be long-term success, 
they're going to have to tackle cravings and recognise emotional hunger. I've got a whole array of crisps and snacks and nuts and anything you care to mention behind here. I never actually eat when I'm stressed, but as soon as I've calmed down, then I start eating. It's almost as if it, it's calming me down to sit and eat. The snack stuff would be the ham and cut off a lump of cheese and stuff it in. Did a little bit of a bad one today. I couldn't resist a donut, a birthday donut. I know they say no food's forbidden, but a donut just didn't seem right. This has been the first day since I've started this that I've actually really, really wanted something. I felt really down and I was really upset and the only thing I wanted was, uh, you know, a sweet and a crisp. I probably never even thought about emotional eating until this whole thing begun. The tapping technique will help them to take charge of their emotional eating. I nearly reached for a slice of ham, but I stepped back and I did close my eyes and I tapped. As soon as I stepped back and did that, the whole thing went. Chris and the rest of the family seem to have cracked it. But Hayley is still a little self-conscious about using the tapping technique. I feel quite stupid doing them sometimes. I haven't done the tapping one, I've got to admit. Not yet. Um, I feel silly doing it. If anyone needs to practice this, it's Hayley. She must get control of her binge eating. Fortunately, we've got the answer next week. Well done. You guys are doing fantastically. Ben, let me ask you, what kind of changes have you noticed? A lot of my clothes fit me a lot better now. You definitely look thinner to me. Now, what about uh, around food? Do you feel more or less in control? Uh, I do. There's a couple of uh, trigger f foods for me that yep. I have to step back and think, well, slow down. But yep. other than that, yeah, I'm in complete control. That's brilliant. Now, Hayley, how about you? Tell us, what differences have you noticed? Um, I feel more in control of food. Yeah. I feel really silly doing the tapping. Yeah. I've got to admit, I do yeah. feel silly. I've found that I'm taking myself off to do it. I yeah. find that I, I crave something, and rather than standing there and doing it, yeah. I go off to another room where no one can see me. I don't blame you. A lot of people don't want to do it in public. What kind of other differences have you noticed? Anything in your confidence, anything like that? Yeah, my confidence has gone up, definitely. I also noticed that when I'm in company, the first person I would ask if I wanted something would be me. Yeah. Um, people have stopped doing that because I've stopped constantly eating, yep. people have stopped offering me constantly, Fantastic. which is good. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Makes Fantastic. it easier for me. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, the Crisfords. <laughs> now, one of the reasons that dieting really doesn't work or works for hardly anybody is because it relies <laughs> on willpower. And one of the most important principles that I want to put across to you is that the imagination is always more powerful than the will. Yeah? And it works like this. Using dieting, you will yourself not to, say, have chocolate cake. You go, I mustn't have chocolate cake, I mustn't, I mustn't. But then you imagine how delicious it's going to taste as it melts in your mouth. And, of course, you give in to that desire. Mm. All your food decisions happen in your imagination. That's why menus are written in such seductive terms. You know, they'll say something like, uh, goujons of soul, lightly sautéed, and served in a delicate lemon sauce, rather than dead lump of fish. <laughs> now, that's because they want to sell you the idea of the food. Who here, when they look at the menu, tastes all of the food in their imaginations first? Yeah? Mind and body are linked, and the imagination is always more powerful than the will. Your body is always responding to what you're doing to it through your imagination. I mean, right now, will your heart beat to go faster? Go on, will it? Go on, try and make it go faster. It's not going to make any difference, is it? But let's try an imagination exercise to see if we can get our heartbeat to speed up. Just imagine that you're walking down a dark alley late at night and you're hearing footsteps behind you and you decide to walk a bit quicker. But the footsteps behind you, they start to go quicker too. You're going quicker, the person behind you is going quicker. You don't know who it is. You're heading down the dark alley. They're getting closer and closer. Oh my God, they're getting so much closer. That's it. And then open your eyes and come on back out. Now, who finds that their heartbeat's going quicker? 
Of course, because when we use our imagination, the nervous system cannot tell the difference between a real and a vividly imagined experience. So when you're vividly imagining foods all the time, guess what's happening? You're making your mouth water, you're cranking up your desire. Let's try this for an experiment, shall we? So imagine a lovely big chocolate cake. Let's put one up on the screen. There we go, lots of chocolate sauce on it. Now that looks good, doesn't it? Looks very appetizing. But what happens if you imagine maggots crawling all over us? <laughs> Suddenly, your desire isn't there, is it? Yes. You see, you can use your imagination to turn off or reduce desire. Now, I'm going to show you a technique in just a moment that will do that to the foods that you are addicted to. You know, the ones that you don't have power over, that when you see, you just got to have. Yeah? and you don't have any conscious choice over, you feel that automatic desire around, I've got a technique that switches that off. Who here is addicted to chocolate and wants me to help them overcome their addiction to chocolate so that they either never eat it again or never feel compelled to eat it again? Yeah? Let's just have a quick chat with you. What's your name? Vanessa. How much chocolate do you eat each day? About four bars. Four <laughs> bars of chocolate. Fantastic. Come and join us. <laughs> So, Vanessa, mm -hmm. I'm going to make it so that chocolate is never the same for you again. Is that okay? Yes. Because I just want to test your level of desire, because look what I have here. Oh, hey. That's your crack cocaine, that is, isn't it? <laughs> On a scale of one to a hundred, where's your desire for that? A hundred. <laughs> A hundred. I'd have that now. You, you want that all now, don't you? You want it, don't you? <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> Is there a food you hate? Jelly deals. So if I had a big plate of jelly deals here, how would you feel about eating those? Oh, I feel sick. Yeah, now, look at that. I said, imagine a plate of jelly deals, and Vanessa instantly, she went back. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an associational link to chocolate that's one of disgust. So, let's have another big plate of jelly deals. And you know what would be even more disgusting? If we took the hair off a barber shop floor and sprinkled it on the jelly deals. That's it. Eat it. There we go. That's it. Go on. That's it. Hairy jelly deal. Ooh, lovely. Zoom. Chew it. Chew it. Chew it. Swallow it down. Mm. That's it. Let's add to that plate of jelly deals, shall we? Let's take, imagine we got a spittoon and we poured some of that. Ooh, Mix it all together. There we go. And now take a mouthful of that. Oh, chew on it and swallow it down. Mm, that's disgusting, isn't it? Oh, that's it. Stop. That's quite enough. When people say to me, do you think human beings are suggestible? I go, what do you think? Oh, that's disgusting, isn't it? Mm. Now, close your eyes and imagine a big bar of chocolate. But when they were making this chocolate, they mixed in jelly deals hair and spittoon. It's a lovely, lovely flavour. Break a bit of it off, chew it in your mouth. There's loads of hairs. You're not sure where some of those hairs have come from. Oh, my God! And there's loads of spittoon in it as well. Taste the chocolate. Oh, that's it, good. And then stop. Open your eyes, come on back out. Now, if I say to you now, only uh, a few moments later, fancy some chocolate? No, but I thought you loved chocolate. Have some choc choc chocky. On a scale of 1 to 100, where's your desire for that? No. You, no. you, you sure you don't want to go and smell it? No. Oh, you know that melts in your mouth, that does, doesn't it? Oh, okay, stop. There we go. Okay, so you were using chocolate to make yourself feel good. Mm. I'm going to give you more good feelings by reprogramming you so you don't need to go and create those good feelings artificially with craving food, yeah? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Close your eyes and remember a time you felt very, very good. Yes, keep it private, don't tell us what it is, but, oh, it's one of those good. <laughs> That's it, return to it now. And make the colours richer and brighter and bolder, make the sounds louder and the feelings stronger. That's it, good. Woo! That's it, you nearly slid off the chair there. That's it, I know. That's it, good. Feel really, really good. Woo! That's good, and then stop. I think you need just a little more, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a quest to find out how much pleasure one human being can stand. <laughs> Close your eyes and remember a time you just felt very happy. Maybe you're like on holiday or, you know, you're with somebody you love. And add it to that other happy memory. Woo! That's it. And let all those good feelings feel so good all over again. <laughs> <laughs> and then open your eyes and come on back out. Now, you feel pretty good right now. Yeah. But I've put really good feelings on your shoulder. And even the thought of my hand getting closer is beginning to make them happen, isn't it? You can <laughs> feel them building. And woo! <laughs> quite enough of that. Okay, now... <laughs> What we're going to do is we're now going to take those good feelings and we are going to trigger them off at the times when you would have had chocolate. Okay. Yeah? Close your eyes and fire off that good feeling and imagine 
all the different times when you would have had chocolate to make yourself feel better, but instead feel this good, this wonderful good feeling that you're feeling now, but just feel it naturally, and you feel so much better. Open your eyes, come on back out. Feel good? Yeah. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. Would you like some of this? No. You sure? No, thank you. No, smell it. No, thank you. It's not for you. No. no. But if I say, can you imagine being in the situations where you used to have chocolate, but without having it, how do you feel about that? I'm without... not bothered at the moment. You're not I bothered? I don't feel bothered. No. You don't feel bothered? No. Okay. I'm not bothered. Right, so your face does not look bothered. <laughs> You're cute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. So, guess what? We're all going to do it. What I want you to do is think about something that you feel repulsed by, some food that you would never eat. And now, what I want you to do is on one of your hands, in fact, let's make it your left hand, I want you to squeeze your thumb and middle finger, okay? Close your eyes and imagine eating the food that you are utterly disgusted by and throw in the hair and throw in the spittoon. Oh, and that's it. Take it to a point at which you are totally and utterly repulsed. Taking a bit into your mouth, chewing it, swallowing it down, mixing some hair and spitting with it. Oh, it's disgusting, isn't it? Oh, that's right. Now, I want you to mix it in with a little bit of the food that you feel out of control around, with the addiction food. That's it. A little bit of your chocolate or your cheese or whatever it is in. We're using one feeling to collapse the other feeling. That's it. And then, as soon as you've done that, and the food that you did feel addicted to does not feel as, as potent, does not feel as pleasurable, stop, open your eyes, come on back out. Okay, now... Very important, what we do next is we give you the good feelings that you were getting from that favourite food, but without you having to eat it. So, what I want you to do is to, if it's safe and appropriate to do so, close your eyes and just remember, return to a time you felt very, very good. A time you felt very happy, maybe you're on holiday with somebody you love, something like that. And this time, I want you to squeeze the thumb and finger together on your right hand, on the opposite hand. Yes, make sure it's the opposite hand. Squeeze thumb and finger together and create a strong associational link between that good feeling and the squeeze of your thumb and middle finger on your right hand. That's a good. See what you saw, hear what you heard, and feel how good you felt. Like you're back there now. The colors are rich and bright and bold. The sounds are loud and crisp. The feelings are strong. Keep going through it. Go through it again and again and again. And now I want you to think about another time, another time you felt very good. Maybe a time you felt immense pleasure. That's it. See what you saw, hear what you heard. And if you're thinking, oh, I can't remember a time I felt pleasure, what would bring you pleasure? That's right. That, that'll do. See what you saw, hear what you heard. Feel how good you felt. That's it. Squeezing thumb and finger together on your right hand. That's a good, really strong. That's it, doing it now. That's right, and then open your eyes, come on back out. Now, squeeze your thumb and finger together on your right hand. Who feels good? Show me. That's right, who feels very good? Yes. Now, what we're gonna do is we're now gonna take those good feelings and we are gonna program them into your future so that whenever you need those good feelings in future, instead of having to use comfort food, boom, instantly, your brain kicks off good feelings inside you, so you feel good without comfort food. So if it's safe and appropriate to do so, close your eyes, if not, keep your eyes open, and squeeze your thumb and middle finger together on your right hand, on the good feeling hand. Here we go, now. Return to those good memories, see what you saw, hear what you heard, feel how good you felt, make the colors rich, bright and bold. There we go, get those good feelings going, and now, I want you to take those good feelings and imagine being in every situation where you, you, where you normally comfort eat, but instead of comfort eating, you do something else instead. You just feel really good for no particular reason. So take those good feelings maybe into the workplace, take them at home, take them wherever, wherever you need those good feelings, wherever you used to comfort eat, have good feelings instead of comfort eating. Have a few challenges. Notice how well you handle a few challenges with good feelings going on. And when you've done that, when you can totally imagine your life without comfort food and with good feelings open your eyes come on back out who feels good excellent and who's going to be able to feel good without <coughs> comfort eating fantastic this week I want you to remember the four golden rules and start practicing the techniques as well the more you practice them obviously the better they get now you're halfway through the system but remember you need all of the instructions to achieve permanent weight loss Next week, an essential part of the system. Feel good about yourself. Boost your confidence and reduce your waistline permanently. Plus, a powerful technique to banish binging forever. See you then. Good night. I think we've...
all got to give it a try because you've got nothing to lose. You've only got to gain. If you offered me chocolate now, I would I would be sick. I really thought I was going to be sick on the stage. I can't wait to find out if at my time of day, when I go for my little nibbles and things, they've actually stopped me. I think this ought to go into every school in the country. You won't have any fat kids. Easiest way in the world to take exercise. No pain, no sweat, and it will make a big difference to your waistline. I'll be busting the myth of metabolism and showing you simple ways to boost yours, plus a new technique to keep you motivated in future so the weight stays off for good. And join me as I put my reputation on the line as we reveal the final results of this, the world's biggest television weight loss experiment. Oh, my God! Are you ready to lose weight forever? To feel better about yourself. To escape your fixation with food. This is not a diet. You can join in and make this Britain's biggest weight loss experiment. All you have to lose is weight. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul McKenna. Excellent. Welcome to the last show in the series. Hey, don't worry, don't worry. We've still got a lot of great stuff to do tonight. We have had the most amazing response to this show. Over 70,000 people have registered their weight and are now taking part in this show, which makes it the world's biggest weight loss experiment. And... Over 80% of you tell me that you feel more in control around food, which is fantastic. But does that mean I've made you thinner? Well, we will find out later. Now, if you've only just joined us, not to worry, there's still time to catch up. Here is how the system works. So far, we've learned the secrets of naturally thin people. Follow these rules and you'll lose weight and keep it off forever. Rule number one, when you're hungry, eat. Never starve yourself, because it slows down your metabolism and your body stores fat. Let your body know that there'll always be enough food. Rule number two. Eat what you want, and not what you think you should. When you make a food forbidden, it instantly becomes more attractive. Never let food have power over you again. If you want something, have it. Rule number three. Eat consciously. Slow your eating speed down to a quarter and enjoy every mouthful. Put your knife and fork down between each mouthful so that you can hear the signal from your stomach that lets you know you're getting full. Rule number four. When you're full, stop eating. Never get stuffed or bloated ever again. This is the way that naturally thin people eat. As you follow these simple rules, your eating patterns will change forever. When you're hungry, eat. Eat what you want. Eat consciously. And when you think you're full, stop. I've shown you how to instantly overcome any cravings using the amazing TFT tapping technique. By tapping on various acupuncture points, you program your brain just like a computer so that any cravings will instantly disappear. And last week, I showed you a technique to stop binge eating. It works on a very simple principle, that all feelings start in one place and move in a particular direction. Through this simple imagination exercise, it becomes easy to reverse the direction of the feeling, reducing and eliminating it. OK, now, I want to find out how you guys have been getting on, uh, any questions you have, any successes you want to share, any challenges you've been facing. Who wants to talk to me? Yes. Hello, ma'am. What's your name? I'm Angela. From? Hastings in East Angela from Hastings. What would you like to say? I just want to say that I feel like I'm walking taller and I'm only five foot one. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else notice more confidence? Yes, fantastic. That will be a byproduct of this uh, for a number of reasons, you know, because of the techniques we did last week. But also, when suddenly you get control back in your life and you're not fretting and worrying, because I know that many of you tried dieting, would wake up in the morning and the first thing you think about is, now, what, what, what am I, I going to have for lunch? What am I have for breakfast? Yeah, anybody resonate with that? Yeah, absolutely. Now, you go, you know, I'll eat when I'm hungry, or you might look forward to it, but it's no big deal. 
you're free to think about other things, yeah? Uh, free to concentrate on all the good things in your life. Plus, of course, when the, with the tapping, produces more serotonin, more happy chemicals. So you're going to feel better. Who else would like to share something with me over here? Yes, this lady here. Ah, let me come up here. Hello, what's hi. your name? Sheila. Sheila, hi, where are you from? Dulwich. Okay, and Sheila, what would you like? Do you have a question or something you want to share with us? No, or? I'd like to say that because I'm now in control, I yeah. always used to take food out in my handbag mm. in case I was stuck somewhere and I couldn't eat. Yes. I mean, in London, there's a million places, but now I don't do that and I've actually started going to the gym. Fantastic. Went That's this morning. A excellent. <laughs> excellent. Oh, ah, ha, ha. <laughs> now there's somebody here who I want to talk to. Have you had any chocolate? No. You no. haven't had any? No. Well, I thought you loved chocolate. You eat a lot of chocolate. Not now. I've changed. I don't have any chocolate. I haven't had any sweets, any cakes. Have you had any desire, haven't you? No, not at all. And how have you been feeling in yourself? Just, I feel fantastic. I'm, I'm determined. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be slim by the summer. Fantastic. Who else got a question? Who else got... Yes, let me ask this lady her question. Yes, what is it, man? Hello, what's your name? I'm Yvonne from Whitstable. Hi, Yvonne. And what's your question? Um, a lot of my friends have been telling about our techniques. Yes. And they are very negative. Yeah. Which tends to rub off on me. How okay. do I stay motivated? What a great question. Now, the thing is this. Sometimes when you tell somebody that you're making, you know, life change, uh, some people will feel sceptical and cynical. Now, there's a couple of reasons. Because maybe these people have tried to lose weight themselves and have failed. Yeah? So, you know, they think, oh, you know, nothing works. The other thing is this. When you make a powerful change in your life, it reminds them that they're a bit out of control and subconsciously that makes them tense and feel bad. So it's not that your friends uh, you know, are bad or anything like that. It's just that um, it's reminding them that they're out of control around food. Yeah? Yeah. So why don't you invite them to try it and, and you know, not necessarily believe whether it's going to work or not. Just try it and see what happens. I will do. Great. Fantastic. We have been getting lots of emails from people. In fact, uh, people have asked me, for example, Pam Gleave says, I know it's probably a daft thing to say, but I'm actually fitting into the bath now. <laughs> Sally Watts has emailed me. She said, uh, tonight I had an exciting confrontation with a chocolate cake, but the <laughs> tapping system won through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also... Uh, a lot of people say to me that they're worried about uh, how this is going to work in the future. They say, well, what if it stops working? The system cannot stop working. You can stop doing the system. So you can stop working at it. But it's very simple. If that does happen, and occasionally it does, what do you do? You go back to the four golden rules. So what do you do when you're hungry? You go and... Eat! And you eat what you... Want! Not what you think you should. And how do you eat? Consciously! And then when you think you're full, what do you do? Stop! Just eating, yes, fantastic. That's all there is to it. You need to stay watching so that you get all the system. Because even though you may have had great success so far, in order to maintain permanent weight loss forever, you need to follow all the instructions. Tonight, I'm going to show you how to get totally motivated. And then I'm going to teach you some simple methods to boost your metabolism, to increase weight loss, when I reveal the secrets of easy exercise. <gasps> I said the word exercise, <laughs> and I noticed some people went, oh, exercise. <laughs> Anybody here uh, paid a year's membership to a gym and then gone for like a week or something like that? <laughs> yes. You start with good intentions, don't you? Yeah, and, and of course many of you, I'm sure, have uh, bought one of those exercise bikes <laughs> off television, and it arrived. If, actually, the moment you ordered it, you felt better, didn't you? You, you felt like a burden lifted. You you felt fitter. There was less guilt going on. And it sat there, didn't it? And you thought, I know what I'll do. I'll hang my clothes on it. <laughs> and then, because it was making you feel guilty, you've hung more and more and more clothes on it until basically you've built a little Wendy house in one of the rooms, haven't you? And then, of course, there's those things for exercising your, your thighs. You know, you say, no, 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 not a bloke. No, no, you know what I'm kinds of wacky gadgets and you use them for you know a week or so and then you can't be bothered yeah that's not easy exercise tonight I'm gonna show you easy exercise you see I know what you like <laughs>
told you there was an easy way to exercise that involved no sweat, hardly any extra time, and no cost, who here would be interested? Yay! Tonight I'm going to show you how to enjoy exercise and how to speed up your metabolism. See you in just a moment. <laughs> Plus, it's results day for our fat-busting family. Find out if the system has worked for the Crisfords and our studio audience. Has it worked for them? And has it worked for you? Big results coming up in just a moment. <laughs> oh, my God! Welcome back. Now, I want to talk about the myth of metabolism. You may have heard people say things like, oh, well, you see, the reason I'm overweight is slow metabolism. You know, like it's some kind of lottery that you're, you're just born with a slow metabolism. It's just not true. But before I explain some more, let's understand a little more about metabolism. Frustrated dieters constantly blame a slow metabolism for their weight problems. And for those thin people who can eat whatever they want without putting on a pound, all credit is given to a fast one. Contrary to popular belief, you're not born with a fixed metabolism. And there are certain things you can do to change it. But what exactly is metabolism? Metabolism is really about the way our bodies take the food we eat and convert it into the energy we need to go about our everyday lives. It's the equivalent of putting petrol in your car to make it go forward. So to get your metabolism revved up and working, your body needs energy from food. When we eat food, that's digested, it's absorbed, and the glucose and the fat are transported in our bloodstream, and they go to provide the energy that every single cell in the body needs. Your heart needs energy in order to pump the blood around the body. Your lungs need energy to breathe, and of course your brain needs lots of energy too. So your body uses food as fuel to create energy. But if there's not enough, your metabolism slows down and your body goes into starvation mode and starts storing fat. And there's a biological reason why. When people go on a diet, their metabolism does change. Your body recognises it's not getting as much food, as much fuel as it needs. The reduction in metabolic rate you see when people are dieting is essentially a very sensible evolutionary response to times of famine. If food was scarce, it made good sense to conserve energy. And so your metabolic rate decreases. So if you're overweight, you can't blame your metabolism. The theory that people who are overweight have a slow metabolism really is one of the great dieting myths. And it's this myth of metabolism that's one of the biggest misconceptions of the weight loss world. It seems that overweight people actually burn off more calories than their thin friends. Not because they're metabolically more active, but simply because they're bigger. They've got more cells, more tissues, and bigger organs to support. One of our studies, we took a group of lean subjects and a group of overweight volunteers. And we overfed both groups by the same amount. What we discovered is that both groups gained weight at exactly the same rate. And later, when we underfed them, they both lost weight at exactly the same rate. And I think that study really puts the idea of differences in metabolism to rest. So if you're overweight, there are certain things you can do to boost your metabolism. The best way to do this is through exercise. People can increase the, their energy needs by being more physically active. Some people who have a very sedentary life will only use 20 or 30% more calories than if they'd stayed in bed all day. In contrast, somebody who's very active can almost double their basic metabolic rate by being very physically active and burning off a lot of extra energy. The very best way to boost your metabolism is to become more active. Simply sitting in a chair uses up more energy than lying down. Standing up uses more energy than sitting down. Walking or climbing stairs all increase your metabolism and your energy needs. You really can make a huge difference to your energy requirements by adopting a more physically active lifestyle. So if you want to boost your metabolism, don't starve yourself and move your body more, which will make you feel better too. It's important for our everyday well-being that we have balanced levels of neurotransmitters like serotonin in our brain. Interestingly, exercise, particularly vigorous exercise, has been shown to increase levels of serotonin naturally within the brain. 
And so regular, vigorous exercise two or three times a week can enhance somebody's well-being and keep them on the right track. OK, so the only way to lose weight is to eat less and move more. Now, you've tried eating less with dieting, and it hasn't worked, because you tried with willpower, and it didn't work, yeah? And I've showed you a way to condition yourself so that you eat less, slowing the eating speed down, listening to the signal. It's the same with moving more. Many of you joined a gym, right? And you went at it for a few days, and you thought, oh, this is too much, and you gave up. There is a way to condition yourself to move more that's easy. Because, you see, when you're overweight, what happens is you feel lethargic, and so you're less active, and so, you know, you feel bad, and so you eat more, and then that makes you more overweight, and so, etc., etc. It's a vicious circle. But there is a way to speed your metabolism up and it's through exercise. Now, who here doesn't do any exercise? What, so you don't get out of bed, right? You just, you didn't get dressed today. Well, so somebody carried you here, did they? Yeah? Exercise is anything that gets your heart beating faster and you breathing more deeply. Yeah. It took a moment, didn't it? Yes, that is exercise. I'm prescribing it to you. <laughs> You're already doing exercise.